Hello and welcome to the conference from ESPON 2020 to ESPON 2030, hosted by the ESPON 2020 Managing Authority here at the Ministry of Energy and Spatial Planning in Luxembourg. My name is Terry Martin. I'm a broadcast journalist and director of the SPIA Research Communications Agency based in Berlin. It's been a great pleasure to be back here with the ESPON community again today and to I'll be your host today for this conference. I'm just going to give you a quick look ahead of at what's coming up and we'll get started. Uh, we have four parts to today's conference. It's going to run through around one o'clock. We're going to try to end roughly on time. Um, the first part is just introductory remarks from three distinguished speakers. Then we have a, a session introducing the ESPON 2030 program. Uh, then we have an interactive session Again, many excellent speakers uh, looking at the potential for implementing that program, the challenges and, uh, and capabilities. And finally, we break it down at the end with some key messages summing up what we just talked about. There's going to be plenty of opportunity for all of you to join. I know that there are well over 300 people from the research uh, and policy communities, also many NGOs joining us today, and we'll be able to offer your questions and your comments, which we'll try to integrate uh, into the second half. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first distinguished speaker, opening remarks coming from uh, Berlin this morning, the gentleman who would normally be right here in this building, this is actually his office, uh, <laughs> had to depart on urgent business and is in Berlin dealing with, well, perhaps he'll let us know what that is, but the um, Klaus Turmes, the Minister for Energy and Spatial Planning for Luxembourg, he, his office hosts the Espon Managing Authority, which is where we are today, and it's our great pleasure to introduce him from Berlin, thank you so much for joining us under very difficult conditions. The floor uh, is yours. Good morning, uh, everybody, and I think you have already got some scenery of uh, my beautiful country, Luxembourg. So good morning, uh, Elisa Pereira, dear Elisa. Uh, good morning, uh, Apostolos uh, Tsitsikostas, the president of the Committee of the Regions. Uh, good morning, uh, Yunus Omaji, who is chairing uh, the greatest parliament in the world, the European Parliament's uh, Regional Committee, uh, and also uh, welcome uh, Nathalie Salavezol, who is uh, chairing the Committee of Region Cotair uh, Committee. Um, I will try to give a bit of a, I would say, philosophic um, introduction to why we need spatial planning and uh, why ESPON is uh, so important. Probably history or historians will say, when they look back to these years, 2020, 2021, 2022, maybe 2023, that was the years of multi-crisis. Um, we are just coming out of COVID. Um, maybe it, COVID is the virus is doing a pause. Maybe it is, it is vanishing, so we will see in the next winter. Um, what I can tell you also for having been in a government who has had to deal with it, it was very, very difficult to have a science-based, uh, up-to-date uh, decisions. We were in such a hurry. We were, especially in the beginning, we didn't really know what was, uh, what was coming with this COVID. So I hope that now that we have maybe a bit of uh, time to analyze, that we will go back to certain decisions we took and maybe that spatial to to uh, analysis can also right. help us to understand, was it really reasonable to forbid people to go to a green park or to go to fish uh, on, a, on, a, on a sea? Uh, where were masks affected and not? Uh, how much uh, greenery do we need in the cities in this kind of very uh, tough a uh, crisis where, where not everybody has a garden on its own. So uh, I think that spatial planning needs to be part of the post-COVID analysis so that we are better prepared uh, and that we have better answer maybe in future uh, when it comes to this kind of pandemics, which uh, science also tells us that this was not the last pandemic. Then maybe a word on this uh, war um, 
I think this war surprised almost everybody, maybe some people in the uh, intelligence uh, of certain nations uh, less. Um, so I, I, I am still puzzling or puzzled, w what is this war about? And I think it's more a war uh, of uh, a regime, a man who is leading this regime, who has failed to insert Russia, this 140 million population, into the modern world. I think that citizens today want freedom. Citizens want self-determination. And probably this uh, citizens' movement in Belarus, uh, the revolutions which took place in Ukraine, maybe even the revolutions uh, recently in Kazakhstan, that is what really was a threat uh, to Mr. Putin's regime. And maybe this war is more like a diversion from the, the, the bad state of his own nation uh, than anything else. So uh, let's see. Um, some are now saying that this is the start of a new polarized world. And of course, beneath the Russian elephant, there is the other Rus uh, elephant in the room, which is China. And the question of what, what is what 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 lesson will China take from uh, Putin's invasion of Ukraine? Um, can we imagine a democratic China, or is China forever, in a certain sense, also a regime which does not allow citizens? to have freedom and self-determination. I, uh, I don't know if spatial planning will help us a lot on that questions, uh, but uh, I, I at least wanted to share these questions with you. And then, of course, now we are rushing into multi-billion uh, arms race. So it's a bit surprising to me how much money we are now able to free for, for, for military equipment, whereas Personally, I think that the biggest war and the biggest crisis we are in is our, our war against nature. Um, so what does science tell us on climate change? That for the last 50 years we have in your science that we have 10 years to go. What does science tell us on biodiversity loss? Uh, I think it's 50 years of lost time and then uh, we have now really to, to work on issues like no net land take and also managing uh, rural areas. So in that respect, I'm quite pleased that at least when it comes to climate change, when it comes to biodiversity, spatial planning at ESPON uh, will be of a big, a big part of the answer. Uh, if I take five points on uh, why is this new uh, program on climate change is important. I think first is where do we locate the renewables? Uh, and probably we would need what I would call a new aesthetics of wind turbines and maybe even a new aesthetics of power lines because green transformation will have a, a, a certain or even a big impact on territories and landscapes. So we need to anticipate that. Um, there will be a new area of research, which is maritime spatial planning. North Sea, Baltic, Black Sea, Mediterranean Sea uh, will be part of the answer uh, through big offshore wind. And that, of course, is in competition with some fishing, with some shipping, with some uh, mining of sand, uh, and maybe even uh, with some military activities. So maritime spatial planning needs to be a full part of the future uh, as well. Uh, third is carbon sequestration. Uh, so uh, I think rural activities farming will have in beneath foot and feed production also to play a role in, in carbon sequestration, but that has also a territorial aspect and we need uh, to integrate that. And maybe the last uh, or the two last aspects is um, mobility needs to be beneath, in a certain sense, spatial planning. I think we have missed, uh, over the last 30 years, 
to, to really organize mobility and technology alone, even the best electric cars uh, will not save us from traffic jams, will not save us from too much resource use. So uh, I think we need a complete rethinking of uh, where do we organize activities of society in order to reduce uh, traffic. Uh, and, uh, and then I think it's um, also important that we work on the aesthetics of public spaces. Spaces shape behavior. And the lifestyle changes we need uh, in mobility, uh, maybe even in diet change, they need also to come from spaces where it is more attractive to walk and to bike and to sit down to, to talk to others than to take a car. And if we want uh, farming or, or diet to be closer against the people, I think we need farms, urban uh, farming to come back to the cities. And maybe a last um, thing which we should do, our, my analysis is that our disruption with nature comes also because most of us live and we live in cities and we have lost the link to nature. So we need green belts around the cities, easy access to the nature around the cities. But I think we need, we need to go beyond that. And that I would call nature experience. I think that we need to reorganize the space in the cities so that also people who live in cities uh, can experience nature. And I think that will be a new strand in the spatial planning or the town, the urban planning, and Aspon uh, could be a part of that story. Um, but this kind of moving society on climate change will not happen if we are in unjust societies. And I think we are in Europe, uh, let's be honest, also confronted with broken democracies. And probably broken democracies as a result of broken territories. So we need much more research into understanding when there is an industrial revolution and activities go, when there is massive outflow of young population as it is happening now for Eastern Europe. So we need to understand how can we anticipate, how do we measure that the territory which was a pleasant place is now um, basically getting into uh, a, a place of what, what you call communities of, dis, of, of discontent. So places uh, which, which are no more attractive. And I think ESPON's new program on governance of new geographies and also perspectives of, for all people and places is exactly something where we should try to understand when, when, where are the tipping points where territories uh, start to be less attractive to their population and generate frustration, which then also often leads to populism. And the last remark, um, I was a bit surprised that ESPON has no global dimension. And um, if uh, the, the green transition will need resources. These resources are not in Europe. The green, the, the, the Europe will need stable territories around it. We see how much Ukraine war affects us. But I think, <laughs> let's be uh, also a bit uh, clear, if Western Africa gets out of control, that will be an even bigger challenge for Europe. So my question to, to those who are designing the programs is, uh, and it is a bit of a dangerous line, uh, also because the first maps were military maps. Uh, I think there was a lot of mapping during colonialism. So how could we organize a global dimension of spatial planning, of European spatial planning positive, uh, uh, policies, who would be inclusive? And maybe just as, a, as an idea which popped up to my mind this morning, 
why won't we, uh, we should at least think about maybe a, a, a Europe or a Western African uh, community spatial uh, program, but which would not be run just by Europeans, but which would be run by, by, by Africans and Europeans altogether, because this will be a, a 500 million plus territory uh, where we need to, to organize renewable energies, where we need to organize public transport beyond the borders, and, and, and. Uh, so uh, isn't, isn't it the moment also where ESPON needs a global dimension and then starting maybe with some territorial, um, basically, program, maybe, as I, I pointed out, as Western Africa. So to close my remarks, um, we in Luxembourg are extremely proud of ESPON that we are able to, to uh, basically to host it. Uh, my thanks go to, go to uh, both Timo uh, Eza, who is in my team, the man who is basically uh, in charge of the whole administration, and then of course also uh, Viktor Sidorowski, who has taken up ESPON and who is now, I think, really engineering the new programs. And thank you, Victor, for your new also impetus uh, into uh, the program. So we said, I want us uh, a good conference today. ESPON is a great instrument and we should uh, care for it. And we should uh, basically look carefully also to the results of it and implement it. Thank you very much. Thank you, <coughs> Minister. Thomas, uh, I just want to say to our audience, uh, you can see the other gentlemen on the stage with me. I'll be introducing them in a moment, but uh, they, they are the Timo and Victors that uh, we just heard re referenced in at the end of that talk. Uh, Minister Thomas, uh, fascinating remarks, uh, very interesting insights, giving us some of the larger themes uh, that are being addressed within the context of ESPON and also giving us some food for thought, uh, proposing perhaps an international dimension to ESPON. Um, I also was uh, intrigued by your comment about the notion that uh, broken democracies may be the result of broken territories. Uh, I found that very intriguing as well. But of course, uh, you, you already mentioned the war uh, that is happening right now in Ukraine, which is going to have an impact on, on everything uh, in Europe, already is to a large degree, some of that you, you touched on. But uh, you mentioned also COVID and the, uh, the climate crisis as well as major challenges. But we have more uh, coming through. I just uh, One thing I failed to mention at the beginning uh, was that there will be a break in the middle of all of this. Uh, that's one part of our, of our program as well. So if, you're, if you uh, are wondering when you're going to have a little break, we do have that built, built, built into it too. So without further ado, let me introduce our, our second distinguished speaker. Uh, Elisa Ferreira is uh, going to be familiar to m many of you, all of you perhaps, uh, the EU Commissioner for Cohesion and reform. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. And uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. I'd like to be physically with you, but uh, I mean, that's that's still uh, a, poss a very important, uh, a very important technological advance of these times. Uh, I think it was one positive thing that uh, that uh, that was banalized after after COVID. But uh, dear Minister Turmes, uh, dear, dear Claude, uh, dear uh, President Titsi Costas, dear, dear Apostolos, um, dear, dear Yunus Omaji, uh, dear, dear uh, Miss Sarah Bezolos, uh, Espan family, Victor and, uh, and, and Timo and all the others, dear colleagues. Well, uh, I think it was, it was great to have this kind of broad setting of the scene done by, by Claude. Um, and now I would like to, to uh, just to, to have a bit of a, of a celebratory uh, kind of, of comment because it's 20 years of ESPON and this is quite a milestone. Uh, I mean, having 20 years of uh, territorial analysis of, uh, of excellence and expertise, uh, bringing academic knowledge uh, to bear on policy changes is, is really a landmark. And, and I think we, we have got to, to also to have a moment of celebrating uh, this, this added value and this knowledge uh, that, that we are all sharing. 
And, and uh, at the same time, it is the perfect moment to take stock of the achievements of the past. And in fact, as, 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 uh, as you, Claude, was, was mentioning, prepare for the needs of the future on the basis of the, of the new challenges that we permanently have got to face. Uh, but it is, in fact, needed. The territorial analysis uh, is, is needed for Europe. And evidence-based policies are needed more than ever. Uh, we just finished the eighth cohesion report, uh, as you know. And, and this creates uh, new, uh, more precise questions that we have to answer. These, these reports, they are published every three years. And in fact, they bring together a host of data and expert and research. Uh, this report is, 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 is in fact uh, a reminder of the strength of Europe's convergence machine. And I would like to, to call your attention on it for, 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 for a while. The report shows that cohesion internal to Europe, but also engaging the neighboring countries, and this is very timely now to address this, but the report shows that cohesion works and, and, and in fact it is more necessary than ever as a global principle of European integration because the Union is in fact as strong as its weakest link. Uh, and, and we need cohesion as an enabler of the functioning of the internal market and of these uh, twin transitions, in particular when uh, uh, we, we, we are facing this, this green and digital transition and also as a leveler, correcting asymmetries and making sure that we all move together. Cohesion's work is best illustrated by the 10 countries that joined the European Union in 2004. And they are being called in now with the Ukrainian war uh, very, very seriously. At the moment of the accession of these countries, they had an average GDP per capita of just six, 59% of the European Union as a whole. But by 2019, that average had risen to 77%. And in other words, their gap with the Euro European average has had almost halved. But in addition to this news, uh, there are some, some, some consequences that we have to draw uh, and that have got to, to be put in our analysis. And that comes also uh, that come also from this eighth cohesion report. Uh, in relation to the first uh, crisis, crises can halt, and they have halted the convergence machine, uh, or even they can reverse this convergence. And in fact, it is absolutely obvious, as as uh, as Claude was mentioning, and also you you picked it uh, when when you made made the introduction. Uh, it is not possible to have uh, democracy, full democracy, and to have a convergent view across Europe and solidarity, if uh, there are fractures in the development. Uh, they trigger fractures in society and they, free, they, they trigger political fractions, very serious ones. And this was, uh, and I'm glad that Claude, you, you mentioned it, the, 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 the geography of discontent really has shown it uh, completely. And, and it, it is something that, that uh, this report is really, I think, uh, a game changer in our perception, in our real confirmation of these perceptions. Uh, but uh, what I was uh, now mentioning is that the crisis, all sorts of crises, the financial crisis, the COVID crisis, and the new crisis now coming from the refugees, they, they, they increase or reverse the convergence trends inside Europe. And we have got to take this into account. And second, there is a growing evidence that the convergence machine is, is stopped somehow in the process of conversion. So when we are now concentrating on innovation, on technology, the leading edge of the most producing firms and regions continues to move forward and the others lag behind. 
and some of the regions that had caught up very, very strongly in the past, now they are caught in the middle, in a kind of a middle income trap, because they have a lot of problems in, uh, in gaining the new uh, capacities to go on with their progress. And this is uh, observed in a lot of places from Southern Europe, Southwestern Europe, even in the middle, of Europe in certain regions from France, for instance, or Italy. This middle income trap is often linked to problems, in fact, with innovation, but also to other types of problems, like the quality of institutions, the quality of the universities, the quality of the public administration. And it is even more crucial when we are betting our agenda for the future in a greener and digital economy that really cannot be absorbed and used by all the different regions uh, at the same at the same pace or with the same viability and this brings to to, to my third finding of uh, also based in cohesion report and this is the need to rediscover a sense of place we have established uh, an interesting program uh, this this, this is not even a program, it's, it's a kind of a wave, we hope. It's the Bauhaus trying exactly to address the quality of the territory. The new European Bauhaus initiative is in fact going to the local and trying to create, to shape the environment because as you mentioned, uh, Claude, it, the, the, the quality of the place where you live, it shapes your attitude. It shapes your, your but a sense of place is needed also when we have horizontal policies, because often they are spatially blind. And so we don't know where things happen. And we cannot control only with cohesion policy, uh, the, the negative and, and sometimes positive, but the, the fractures on the ground. And in fact, for 20 years now, ESPON studies, tools and seminars, they helped us in all these different senses. Uh, I, I, I was reading the, the, the it's, it's important sometimes to have a compte rendu and the 23 applied research pro projects, 28 targeted analysis, ranging in fact from digital innovation in public service provision to territorial impacts of the circular economy or the cultural heritage as a territorial source, all these projects. Uh, we see ESPEN's uh, signature strength of taking cutting edge research evidence and applying it to policy actions and we need it. Uh, and uh, I, I congratulate you, Claude, uh, because ESPEN uh, managing authorities and all uh, those partners, uh, you have, we have all together done valuable work and, uh, and a lot of, of regions, a lot of politicians, a lot of, uh, NGOs, the, everybody has managed a lot, has, has benefited a lot from this work that has been done. Uh, in fact, ESPON has assisted regions, cities, national governments, good policies and strategies rely on good data and good information. And we need it more than ever. ESPON studies have made a particular contribution to cooperate at all the different levels. And I think we cannot disregard the importance of this cross-border, interregional, transnational, and the macro-regional. When we talk about macro-regions inside Europe, we need to know better what we are doing and what are the critical axes on which we have to concentrate. But the expanse tools, conference, seminars, workshops came, I mean, much further than, than the administrations. Uh, but, but they are highly, highly valued by a lot of policy makers at all levels. Um, but uh, so in fact, I, I, I couldn't uh, have this opportunity without thanking uh, ESPON team very, very much and managing uh, authorities and you, uh, Claude, because it is really worth the, the, the work that is being done. And now looking forward, you just set a very interesting framework uh, for on which the, the, the future work is going to be developed. And, uh, but in fact, what was already proposed uh, in the preparatory works uh, is, is very welcomed. Uh, the governance of new geographies, as we transition to green and digital economy, I just mentioned how, how 
how the the impact uh, and the the assets associated with this this uh, green and digital economy how ca are they captured differently by the different institutions and the different territories so we need in fact to address it the resilience of places to crisis is absolutely crucial because uh, as I mentioned before, the crises affect completely differently the different regions. And, uh, and, uh, and in fact, uh, we cannot just be always firefighters as crises are, it seems, coming more and more common. But they, they cannot, we, we are not able, and we, we, are, we were not able until now to, to anticipate them. Uh, but uh, we cannot just be firefighters. We have got really to analyze what are the tensions and how they interact with our territories. Also, uh, I welcome this priority, a perspective for all people and places. I already mentioned the new European Bauhaus, but in fact, we, we have got to take lessons from geography of discontent, and if possible, to change this geography of discontent and make it a geography of opportunities, in which you, you, you give opportunities to people all over the place, wherever they are. Uh, and finally, I, I welcome the priority on climate neutral uh, territories. Uh, yes, I think we have got to, to address these climate change challenges uh, and see how we can turn them into opportunities, into jobs, new activities, sustainable jobs and activities uh, in new places. And all of these priorities, uh, in all of the, these priorities, let us concentrate on and analyze our your territorial evidence and i would particularly highlight the challenge of reaching out to policymakers informing them and thus capitalizing the knowledge generated from espon uh, cohesion co cannot be uh, the work of cohesion policy alone so we need that this concept and this principle is in fact embodied by, uh, by, by policymakers when they established the horizontal policies. The most neutral, so to speak, horizontal policy is asymmetric when it comes to the territory because it impacts different realities in different territories. territories. But to reach out to anyone, we must speak their language and show them evidence in the terms uh, most meaningful to them. And so I urge you to produce useful evidence in all its many different forms from research, data production, policy analysis, and let us all continue to communicate with the programmers and policy makers, identifying key target groups and bringing the evidence effectively to all of them, because this, this is in fact what our work is done for. It's to shape or reshape inform the quality of the decisions that we make every day. And this is what will make the next 20 years of ESPON even more successful. So uh, the work, a new phase of work starts today more with more challenges, with more information uh, for better decisions. So uh, thank you very much. And I look forward to our discussion and our work. Thank you. Commissioner Ferreira, thank you very much to you. Uh, Commissioner Ferreira there reviewing some of the challenges that the European Union is facing with reference to cohesion and uh, reminding us of how important the work is that ESPON is doing in providing the kind of evidence that is needed for addressing those challenges in policy terms. So. Our third distinguished speaker, before we move on to the second section of the program, is Apostolis Tsitsi Kostas. He is president of the Committee of the Regions. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, dear Minister Turms, uh, dear Commissioner Ferreira, uh, dear Elisa, dear Chair of the Regi Committee, dear colleagues. Uh, it gives me uh, great pleasure today to be with you uh, to open this uh, really high-level conference which comes at a moment in time when understanding the territorial impact of crisis, decision-making strategies and funding is of utmost importance for people and for the future of our union. In Europe and in the rest of the world, of course, 
we are having to deal with the social and economic shock of the pandemic. And of course, the deplorable invasion of Ukraine by Russia. Now, both crises, the pandemic and this violent war have caught us by surprise. We have not been ready, uh, either prepared for such uh, crises. Uh, so it has exposed our weaknesses, if you want, and cast a light on the heavy costs of non-cohesion, as I call it. So we can no longer accept any further delay to deepening EU integration, nor any short-sighted rejections uh, of, uh, of shared goals, of means, strategies that we commonly have. And at the same time, these emergencies have made us aware of how valuable our union is. These times of travel have reaffirmed the shared need and strength of European solidarity. We have seen how decisive we can be by working and by responding together. We have seen the value of cohesion as a fundamental value, a European value, and of the unique role of EU's cohesion policy. Now, after years of debate, with some voices even arguing that it is a policy of the past, cohesion has come to our side during these very difficult times of need. It has, and it is, protecting citizens and supporting local communities. It has, and it is demonstrating its ability to respond to both short and longer term challenges. Cohesion has been the glue that blinds our union. And as we speak, EU structural funds are being used to set up refugee facilities, providing housing, healthcare, and school to families fleeing from war. EU structural funds were used to purchase ventilators and protective gear during the worst phases of the pandemic. Also, EU structural funds were used to strengthen intensive care facilities and increase our health system preparedness. So those who still wonder why cohesion policy is used for this crisis must look at its two distinctive features. Firstly, it brings together EU, national, regional, and local actors. And secondly, its place-based approach meets the specific needs of people and their communities, the real needs of the citizens. Now, these two strategic factors are key, if you ask me, for both responding to crises and for longer term changes. So ladies and gentlemen, the cooperation between ESPON and the European Committee of the Regions is therefore a strategic asset for every actor at EU, national, regional, and of course, local levels. We have joined forces to show the vital role of place-based policymaking. We have come together to gather evidence and improve working methods so that EU policies work better and deliver for the citizens. We have cooperated on our committee's annual regional and local barometer, raising awareness on the need to respond to the asymmetric impact of crisis. And we are also working closely together on the cohesion as a value project with an ESPON sponsored territorial impact assessment on the topic. And in particular, I wish to stress the importance of our cooperation on territorial impact assessments, including during the European Week of Regions and Cities. So dear friends, let me be clear. For regional and local leaders, this cooperation is not academic. By assessing the territorial impact of crisis and policies, EU investment and strategies can better take care of our communities putting the European Union to work for the citizens it serves. So in other words, it helps all Brussels policymakers better take into account the impact of every decision on citizens' lives. 
and at the same time shape the best possible tools to address emerging challenges. This is exactly the reason why we have joined forces with ESPO to assess the territorial impact of trends and policies ranging, of course, from zero emissions vehicles to cross-border health threats from emergency and energy poverty to demographic change. Cohesion policy cannot be the only EU policy that helps reduce disparities and address territorial challenges, of course. We need all EU policies to take into account their asymmetric impact on the ground. And our cooperation with ESPON is definitely an asset in this fight. Now, looking at the coming years, we need ESPON to help us in some key areas. Firstly, I would say to adapt spatial planning to the societal changes of the 21st century, meaning climate, resilience, mobility, demography, digital transformation. Secondly, to make cohesion policy even more effective and understood so that we end the short versus long-term traditional approach. For example, can we really consider managing refugee flows or energy disruption as a short-term investment? We need to gather evidence about the impact of cohesion policy and make this knowledge known, especially in the future debate on the next EU budget. Thirdly, we need to promote territorial assessment in other EU policies to increase their impact and facilitate synergies on the ground with cohesion funds. And finally, we need to help the Cohesion Alliance to promote cohesion as a value by making new evidence available in partnership with other research institutions. So we therefore propose, ladies and gentlemen, to work together once again on this year's EU annual regional and local barometer that will address a range of issues, including the impact of war against Ukraine on our regions, the EU's regions and cities. And together we need to address the different implications from the welcoming of Ukrainian refugees to the economic impact of Russia's sanctions not to mention the need to reduce our economic and energy dependency. So we need more and better evidence to guide our political choices in the coming years. So I'm really looking forward to being president of the European Committee of Region, along with all of our commissions and all of our members. We are really looking forward to renewing and shaping a new action plan between the European Committee of the Regions, and ESPO. Now, once this new action plan will be finalized, we would be delighted to welcome you and uh, all of uh, your uh, members to the European Committee of Regions to discuss how, embed, how to embed territorial assessment in EU policymaking, promoting, of course, the fundamental value of cohesion. So thank you again very much, dear colleagues, uh, for inviting me today, and my best wishes for a fruitful discussion in the forthcoming panels. Thank you. Thank you, President Tsitsikostas. Uh, thanks to all three of our distinguished speakers who have given us a lot to already begin to think about at the beginning of this conference. Thanks for taking your time to be with us this morning. And uh, I'm going to give just a quick uh, roundup of what our objectives are over the next while, taking into account what we just heard, because the comments that just came through from all three of our distinguished speakers, our opening statements, uh, have given us not just an idea of where we are now, but how we got here and where we want to go. And that is very much the, uh, the theme of our conference today, looking at ESPON 2020, 20 years of ESPON, almost, a, 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 I think the date is coming up in September, 
uh, as the actual anniversary of the founding of it, but we're looking ahead to the next phase of SBOM. Of course, the objectives of this conference, I'm just going to outline them very briefly before we get into the panel discussion and the, uh, and the presentations that precede it. Uh, we want to raise awareness, of course, of the SBOM 2030 program that's coming up. Uh, that's what, there's been a lot of work put into that to the next seven year planning uh, period, the new strategic integrated approach and the first themes that go along with that approach. We're going to hear a lot about more about those in, the, in this upcoming session. Uh, we want to get the preliminary results of the consultation process on the first uh, thematic action uh, plans that go along with all of this. Again, we're going to hear more about these thematic action plans. Uh, they'll be referred to with the acronym TAP, perhaps. So if you hear TAP, that's thematic action plans. And we're going to discuss uh, how different stakeholders are going to be getting involved. And that's going to be the last part of our, of our conference today uh, and to look at the new targeted analysis approach within ESPA. Now, all of that relates to what we just heard about how how ESPON can contribute to not just cohesion policy, but to addressing some of the crises that uh, the European Union has been dealing with and to maybe help resilience on a territorial level. So uh, thanks again to all our introductory speakers. Um, I appreciate your, your remark, uh, President Tsitsikostas, that uh, ESPON is a strategic asset. I think that was w well appreciated here. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to introduce panelists that are coming up and the present presentations that are just before that. Uh, we have with us today, uh, joining us remotely, of course, uh, because there are really just three of us here on this stage in Luxembourg. So we're coming at this from, from all around the world, uh, it must be said, uh, particularly in, in Europe at this point. But uh, I'll introduce our our five panelists, um, one of whom will be just giving a brief statement in, in French, uh, or six panelists, one of whom will be giving a brief statement in French. Let's start with, uh, let's see if we can see them all. I hope we're all connected. Um, Yunus Omarji is uh, chair of the uh, commission for, uh, the, or rather the chair of the Regi Committee for of the Regions in the European Parliament. Uh, and I, can we see everyone? I'm not sure they're all on your screens, but uh, I'll just go through these very quickly. You may have the, uh, the program in front of you so you can see that yourself. Uh, Natalie Sarabazoles uh, is the chair of the Cotter uh, European uh, Committee of the Regions. Uh, Marc Lemaitre is uh, director general of the DG Regio at the European Commission. Andre rodriguez Pose is professor of economic geography at the, uh, at the London School of Economics. Uh, Romina Boarini is director of the OECD Center for Well-Being, Inclusion, Sustainability, and Equal Opportunity. And uh, Claude, of course, uh, Claude Tormes, uh, the Minister of Energy of Spatial Planning for Luxembourg, whom we've already heard from this morning. Now, uh, Yunos uh, Omarji will be just giving us a video statement, and Nathalie Sara Bazal will give a statement uh, briefly in French, and then we will have the, the panel. Now, the panel will be preceded by a presentation by the two gentlemen who are sitting with me in this room. Uh, Timo Eza, of course, uh, is, the managing, is with the managing authority uh, based here in this office. Uh, and Viktor uh, Shirovsky uh, is with the so-called single beneficiary of ESPON, focusing on the uh, ESPON 2030 priority. He's with the uh, EGTC, again, lots of acronyms, acronyms always when we're dealing with, with uh, ESPON. So if you hear EGTC, of course, you all know this, uh, the European Grouping on Territorial Cooperation. Uh, he is director of that. So without further ado, I will go into a little more on the themes that we hope to address in the panel in just a moment. But let's first have our presentation from Timo and Victor. Managing authority takes care on behalf of the member states, the 27 member states and four partner states in Europe who are the stakeholders behind the program, whereas uh, Victor um, is taking care of the EGTC who does all the implementation of the content part of the program and he precedes uh, 
team of uh, 20 experts. Uh, we are a small unit at the ministry uh, with uh, four people so that you get a bit an idea that uh, who is actually behind it. And that's also uh, the split of our work in the presentation. Uh, so, Timo, if you don't mind me interrupting you, just, just briefly, I, I failed to mention that uh, our there is because there's so many people out there who have joined us uh, and taken time to be with us and we want to get your input today too and we've created an opportunity for that f online through something called Slido uh, you should see it in your window that you're using for your web interface and the Slido is simply you just put a code in which happens to be ha the hashtag is already there SBON I think you just write SBON in that little where it's asking you for a code and then you can contribute any questions or comments that we might integrate into the panels that will be following this. So my apologies, Timo, for, for interrupting you at this point, but we do want to get input from all of the stakeholders who are with us today. Please continue. Thank you, Terry. And uh, this was really a very important remark because, I mean, as it was also said before, uh, we would like to really be close to the users. We would like to improve um, the kind of interaction between research and policy making. And this is uh, one important element of, the, of, of this. But we heard already uh, a lot of ideas and ambitions um, which have been expressed. And thank you uh, very much, uh, Commissioner, um, also President of the Committee of Regions and, uh, and um, um, Claude Thomas. Um, what we actually should do uh, in the next programming period and um, we anticipated of course we had uh, consultations before uh, and I'm happy that we actually capture quite a range of these expectations um, and I will present uh, now the design of the new program. So it was mentioned I mean ESPON uh, focuses on uh, territorial evidence to support stakeholders at all levels. So our uh, DNA, if you like, is to do research evidence production, but we are only successful if we can see that this research is used in practice. And I think that makes us distinguish to other research uh, programs which are uh, on the market, if you like. And we have a clear focus on the green transition to climate neutral economies while ensuring at the same time just living conditions for all people and places. So you can do a lot of research on the green transition, also on the just conditions living, but our core uh, idea uh, is the territorial, the functional place-based approach, and I think that was mentioned uh, several times already. If we don't reach the people in their territory, uh, we will have uh, political consequences. And therefore, our um, focus is really on the territorial dimension of all these sectoral developments. I was mentioning we want to um, serve policy makers, so for us, the policy context is very important to understand. ESPON informs EU cohesion policy, we are part of EU cohesion policy. We uh, understand our role also to um, inform about sectoral policies, their territorial impact. We are related to um, the territorial agenda process on the policy side, national policies that our, are our clients. And um, we also understood that there are a lot of territorial challenges which go across sectors and territories. So we have environmental challenges, social diversities, economic transition, technological transformation, and we have to cope with that in a kind of multi-level governance policy setup. And um, we are fully aware of this rather complex policy context, but on the other side, this actually uh, forces us then to be very clear about how we set up our research and how we make the link to the stakeholders. Just uh, for the timing, uh, we expect that uh, the program will be approved uh, in the second semester by the uh, European Commission. We submitted it in uh, 
uh, late uh, December, we got uh, some remarks and we are um, at the end of uh, clearing these remarks and to um, redraft uh, the program for uh, a second submission. So um, the timing can actually stand. We are working on these uh, thematic action plans, as uh, Terry was already uh, mentioning, that are work streams for us. If you can uh, use a, a, a synonym, it's a thematic work streams where we combine the evidence production with knowledge development, um, which is closely related to our stakeholders, to the policymakers, and then we have uh, this complemented by a series of cross-cutting measures, what we call um, uh, horizontal measures, where we inform across thematic fields uh, to uh, particular policy processes. Now, um, my PowerPoint was falling. I cannot see it at the yeah, moment. This is, uh, this is something that happens from time to time, the, the technical challenges of of working virtually, but look at that. It took our amazing team here. We have an excellent technical team uh, supporting us today, and they, I'm sure, are going to get this back on the screen in just a couple of seconds. Let's see. There, there's a whole team of, of professionals uh, standing behind the scenes who are supporting this, and they, uh, it's in the nature of the beast, as it were. As I'm Over the past couple of years during the pandemic, we've all had plenty of opportunity to uh, to, to participate in, in online conferences. Um, this, is, this one is very well supported uh, compared to many that I've been a part of. So look, there we are, there's the slide. Thank you uh, very much uh, for leading over, Terry. I feel very safe in your hands. <laughs> um, thematic action plans actually are composed, as I said, um, for, uh, by two components. The evidence components where we so, um, uh, carry through territorial analysis, policy analysis, impact studies. And on the other side, um, we thematically combine that with a, what we call knowledge development, um, where we um, link these themes, these thematic results, with processes, with uh, policy makers, workshops, policy prototyping, laboratories, so that the themes are really the um, kind of roof on top of the activities in both directions. There we go. There seems to be a small Luxembourgish gremlin in the system here today, but we are chasing that gremlin, and our <laughs> gremlin hunters are behind the scenes. And look at that. Oh, well... <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think there is some pulling out of hair at the moment, uh, but I assure you we will be getting back on, on track as best we can. Now, I don't know that we have a, a fail-safe for the slide presentation. If it's dropping out completely, it may be a, perhaps we can provide our, our speakers at least with a, a, uh, a hard copy of the presentation, which I can see that Tilo... Timo already has handy to bring out. So we're, again, we're working on, on trying to bring that slide presentation back to you. I, uh, and while we wait I, on that, perhaps uh, Timo can reflect a bit on what, uh, what we've heard and where it's, where it's going. Yes, um, as you said, Jerry, uh, I am um, prepared for a fallback solution. I have a hard copy, so at least I can entertain you, maybe not uh, visually, but uh, orally, on uh, what we are doing. So I just wanted to explain a bit what we understand under the um, thematic action plan evidence production part. I mean, we are looking at uh, European-wide thematic, activities, research projects collabor in collaboration with multilateral organizations. We produce position papers, policy briefs, and um, also um, public policy scenarios. Um, we had quite good experience with uh, scenario development. It animates the political debate and um, really raises awareness. 
Then um, we have also demand-driven thematic activities where we get uh, the demand by the stakeholders and then we bring research and stakeholders together in particular projects, fast track, targeted analysis, um, then case studies uh, which are elaborated together with uh, the policy stakeholders. On the other side, as was said, horizontal measures, cross cutting studies, um, foresight reports, uh, and impact assessment. And then we intend also to do some monitoring uh, uh, activities, such as uh, um, uh, support to the Territorial Agenda 2030. We support cohesion policy programs uh, in, uh, by evidence uh, to develop their strategies and these type of activities. When we turn to the knowledge development, we actually distinguish three types of uh, uh, activities. One are the push activities, where we deliver messages of the evidence production to the stakeholders. So it's with publications, dissemination events, but also what we call pull uh, activities. We attract interest. I mean, we want to go out and um, attract new stakeholders, uh, also um, involve them in cooperation with policy prototyping, peer review workshops, digital communities, and this type of activities. And the third type, um, the accompanying measures, is that we actually um, accompany policy processes, uh, that we establish task, task forces which uh, um, uh, accompany so that there are interlocutors at the side of the EGTC who then are in close contact with those who are in need of certain knowledge. And um, this is then what uh, Victor actually develops with his team and he, he will say much more about the work streams after me. It, it's only on my side now to um, introduce some of the work streams. I mean, in the program, um, we uh, already mentioned seven themes. So um, climate neutral territories, the governance of new geographies. I mean, to think in this place-based um, approach is uh, key and uh, to combine that with the multi-level governance. And as it was mentioned, I mean, we are um, exposed to uh, crisis of one after the other. So for us, the theme is actually places resilient to crisis. I mean, to have a more uh, comprehensive understanding how to react. And also uh, a particular work stream perspective for all people and places. So these four themes are actually already on the way. And, um, but there are three further ones mentioned uh, where we would like to come back. And, uh, um, I'm happy <laughs> that we actually anticipate uh, quite some of the expectations because in this uh, list of research uh, reserve themes, if I may uh, call them like that, there is European territories in global interaction. I mean, we are aware that uh, Europe is not working as a uh, se separate or uh, independent system. We are in inter interaction and we are in, uh, we have to understand uh, our part in the whole division of labor in the world. And this has very territorial effects and uh, we are ready to uh, work on these streams. And by having said that, I hand over to um, Victor, and here is also in case the um, slides turn up the remote control, please. Thank you very much. Indeed, thanks for leaning on the, uh, the traditional uh, way of delivering the, the presentation, which is with hard copy. And uh, thanks a lot to, to the distinguished guests of being with us uh, and presenting the, uh, the setting for, for the ESPON program your expectations and, and also what you intend to do together with us as the humble single beneficiary ESPON EGTC. Uh, while waiting for the presentation to go back uh, on the screen, um, 
we of course have the, uh, the certain milestones altogether. So as said, we are in a transitional period that now we have collected a lot of interesting feedback on the first four TAP themes, but not only, as we also see that interesting ideas popped up into what we could say, as Timo was mentioning already, uh, reserve teams, so those that could be explored a little bit later. Uh, we want to finalize describing these thematic action plans very soon and submit them together with the uh, entire content-related part of the ESPON program for the approval process by the ESPON monitoring committee. So that uh, hopefully in July we can launch the implementation of thematic activities within the first, first uh, four TAP themes but also some of the uh, cross-cutting horizontal measures that President Sitsi Costas was so kind to address, the way that we can cooperate with European bodies, with intergovernmental policy networks to implement the policies close to the people for the local, regional and national level. The overview, let me just share with you a bit of an overview of the consultation process. It was kicked off uh, end of November last year and uh, in the uh, inaugural meetings, uh, we had over 270 participants that were so keen to give us some first insights into the, the content of the new ESPON program. We also organized something we called induced consultation. We approached the networks directly, asking them for their advice on what we can do with the networks and use the networks as the providers of interesting ideas, but also multipliers of the work that ESPON can do together with them. So we had meetings with the Dereggi Committee, European Parliament, the OECD, and several other intergovernmental networks. We also organized a meeting of a so-called focus group that was populated by a lot of researchers and also members in the uh, ESPON Monitoring Committee to tailor-made the future directions of the thematic activities. And altogether, I was saying we got a lot of interesting feedback pieces. About 200 of those came up by end of February. And this is why we are able to firmly stand on the ground to present to you the research directions. Still, we need to, of course, to understand that we are not living in a static environment, that we have and I can see that at least the presentation here is back on the screen, and I don't know if you can see it behind because we cannot see it on our screen, and I cannot actually scroll it, so I would then need the, uh, the technical team to assist us in actually scrolling the slides. So please take the next one then. Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid that's, that our viewers, uh, those who are joining us, can't really see it except also, again, uh, something right. behind you. Um, but so I will have them to continue to verbally entice the people about what we can do together with them. Speaking of the uh, dynamic, turbulent environment, of course we have new circumstances, we have new challenges related with geopolitical landscape and emergency support for the, uh, the current uh, refugee flows of the, result of the war in Ukraine. And this is also what will heavily impact the spatial planning tools and instruments. We, we need to include in our thematic work streams the territorial impacts of the refugee crisis related with the, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine on what it means for our development, what it means for our cohesion, what it means for our geography of discontent or geography of opportunities. Of course, post-pandemic recovery and how to build resilience based on the lessons learned, a very important area of interest that will actually penetrate into the, the very specific part of the uh, new ESPON program. How then to also accelerate the transition to cleaner and fair energy, looking for more affordable, secure and sustainably sourced energy, as Claude Thomas was saying. Achieving a climate neutral economy, equally important, how we could overcome the, the challenges of climate change, environmental degradation, 
And last but not least, digital transformation. How we could find and devise new lifestyle options, how we could have new working patterns and new businesses, and what it means in terms of spatial changes. So all of this we want to address in the, uh, in the work streams. And let me see now if it, if it works. Yes, to a certain extent it does, unless I'm not the one to control the screens. This I don't know. All right, moving on into the, uh, the specific content, where we stand. Governance of new geographies. Um, we right now identified some potential research directions that we would like then to follow based on the, uh, the clear-cut objectives, focus, and, uh, and policy directions. So the governance of new geographies is a very poetic term, we would say, and it was devised together in a co-creation process with the managing authority team here on the top floor, where we are stand right now exactly in the same room. Uh, and we thought that it is important to understand the, uh, the emerging new geographies. Because of those new turbulent developments, we are not going to cope with just a static picture of cross-border areas, of the metropolitan areas, but, uh, but we have to look into the delineations, function and cooperation arrangements, and also who is in need to be involved for those new geographies. So uh, we are interested in a certain functional approach in planning and, and governance, how we could thereby strengthen capacities and skills of, of policy makers. So um, what we want to do together in the ESPON community, and would like to involve policy makers and researchers in that, is to debate those interesting new functional areas, lake regions, areas with geographical specificities, peripheral cross-border areas, to understand the development potential and also how we could delineate those areas based on flows, so based not on administrative borders, but how the different flows shape the territories. And the example of those are geographies of green infrastructure, geographies of health, geographies of pollution, geographies of crime, so all of this that does not tolerate the administrative borders and requires a functional place-based and together created approach between the different levels of policy stakeholders. COVID-19 and how to revitalize functional territories. What Minister Thomas was saying, we need to a new look on mobility patterns and public service provisions. There are some opportunities related with teleworking. We need to understand better what it means for our mobility, what it means for the, uh, the provision of public services. The metropolitan governance, uh, how we can use the metropolitan governance in comparison to the existing administrative divisions, how the metropolitan governance may help deliver EU policies and strategies beyond just the cohesion policy, as President Sitsi Kostas was saying. The cohesion policy is not the only tool that would like to see a very distinct territorial dimension. So all sectoral policies, and also Timo was presenting in the slide on positioning the, the new ESPON program. This is important. Spatial distribution of growth. This is a very interesting topic where the production areas differ from residential areas. So how to understand this co-development in the cross-border context, how the knowledge of flows goes up, how we could distribute tax revenues in cross-border areas, problem of cross-border financing on public services. This is at the center of attention, I believe, for the future ESPON program. And also then the scale-up functional approach in governance arrangements, how to roll out and implement territory governance mechanism for functional areas. Moving on to the next very important block, which is climate neutral territories. And I think this is, uh, well, gives us a lot of uh, important insights, is then how to further develop the knowledge base on the uh, territorial patterns for, for green transition. We know that these patterns are going to differ 
So no territory will be alike in terms of addressing the, the challenges such as economic development, accessibility and social disparities because these territories have such eminent features and how they can move on to the green transition. So strengthening skills and capacities of policymakers to further integrate carbon neutral territories in policy making processes lies at the center of ESPON attention for the future program. So specific potential research directions, you may also then understand that we need to better scale opportunities and challenges of regions because they have different socioeconomic situations and territory specificities. Blue energy and land use planning, Minister Tumas was saying about the, uh, the very prominent role of maritime spatial planning. Indeed, we need to reconcile between the different sea uses, the use for the energy benefits, so energy transition benefits, blue energy energy systems, and also climate plans, but what else could come in a certain clash of functions, in a certain conflict that we need to be able to resolve. Climate adaptation, what we need in terms of a better local cooperation, multi-level governance and cross-border cooperation to tackle the issues of climate change, adaptation, mitigation, and also green transport. How then, in the context of a changed mobility behaviors, understand the role of green transport and how then to measure impacts of changes in mobility on carbon emissions? So very interesting points indeed that we would like to explore a little bit further through the specific activities in the future. Next one is uh, a very important, not to say one, places resilient to crises. Uh, we have witnessed those specific crises and the way that territories respond to those. They are vulnerable in a different way and they need to be better uh, shaped, the policy, policy responses, to adapt and mitigate and increase the capacity of territories to cope with the crisis of the future, different sorts of crises, environmental, economic, sanitary, digital, and so on and so forth. So how we can assist then the policymakers to further integrate the uh, resilience issues in policymaking processes, that, that is of, of interest to ESPON. The potential uh, research directions go very much about the future-proof territorial resilience. And I think this will be our mantra for the future, not just sustainability in development, but also resilient territories. How we could, together with our peer organizations, because ESPO is not the only one delivering on evidence, and Romina Boarini is leading one of the important areas of research about the well-being, the quality of life, the social aspects, how together with many other organizations delivering on evidence, we could create a reference framework and system analysis for future-proof territorial resilience. How we could increase the capacity building uh, in the territories to anticipate, mitigate measure. Also a very interesting topic of intergenerational divides in European regions, how resilience can cope with that, because we see that the needs and behaviors of generations are different between the elderly and the young cohorts in our societies. There is the value of culture for territorial resilience. Can we see it or can, can we identify some important issues here together that we could improve the understanding and the knowledge of those? And also, last but not least, cyber resilience practice. How we could safeguard local democratic processes and guarantee the availability of crucial public services because of a potential hacking attacks. So again, this digital resilience question comes here into the play. And then the last of those four TAP themes, and I think a very broad one, but equally important, perspectives for all people and places, convergence processes. Minister Thomas, Commissioner Ferreira, was, were talking a lot about convergence between European territories. But we need to get the people and the places behind it. So not, no place and no people are left behind those convergence processes. But again, we need to scale the territorial dimensions of those economic and social transformation. And we need to be able, together with the policy makers, to strengthen the diversity, to strengthen the capacity to address the diversity of territorial development models in that respect. 
And then the research directions that we see quite, quite probable in the future ESPON program is the, the matter of how we could again understand this convergence driven by interregional linkages and flows. Uh, labor market, how we can adapt to the current flows, the supply of the labor market, what kind of new territorial models for inclusive and sustainable economic growth and foundational economy and public investments could we see livable environments and spatial planning response, and also then the potential of all places, how we can work together with citizens, and how we could involve the social innovation in, in all of that. So this is uh, the program in a nutshell, the first 40 AP themes. Of course, we are eager to employ more TAPs on our way to, the, uh, to implementing the UNESPON program. As mentioned, we are also collecting ideas for the further ones that will also address the issue of Europe in a globalized world and what spatial planning can do good or perhaps bad about it. So thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Victor and, and Timo. I'm, I'm sure that if we were all assembled here in one room, there would be a, a, a round of applause for your for your amazing resilience, indeed, yourselves, and being able to, to respond to that difficult situation. Um, yeah, our apologies to everyone uh, who is joining us, uh, wherever you may be. Apologies for the technical hitches that we've run into, some of the glitches. We, we seem to be on top of them now. The, uh, the gremlins in Luxembourg are particularly tenacious, but uh, <laughs> we do have a, a good team, as I say, and they're working feverishly behind the scenes to make sure that the rest of uh, everything moves slow, uh, moves more smoothly with respect to the, uh, the PowerPoint presentations. We, uh, there was one comment that's come through of uh, one that you might expect um, in our, our Slido relative to what just happened, and that is uh, a request that the presentation be made available uh, to our, yes, very, I'm seeing a, a nod from, from one of our uh, very capable uh, participants here who's supporting us uh, from ESPON. Uh, so you can expect to see the, the PowerPoint presentation that was interrupted uh, will be made available to it. It is really a, a wonderful, uh, wonderfully put together piece of work that explains exactly where ESPON is headed and uh, the, the complexities, because it is indeed a, a very complex undertaking doing this kind of targeted research, making sure that it addresses the needs of the stakeholders and addresses the, uh, that it's also shaped by the stakeholders. And there, there's, some, there's, a lot of, there's a lot to wrap your mind around there conceptually uh, indeed. So uh, you've had some input now on where ESPON is headed and, and why and how and uh, what sort of directions it is going in. You've got something on the, on the status quo. We've looked at the structure, uh, the, the evolving structure of ESPON as after its first 20 years, as it's moving towards ESPON 2030 in light of the different needs within, within the European Union. And we've also you know, heard some more mind-expanding notions that perhaps uh, ESPON could be expanded to take in uh, larger territorial considerations while still drilling down into the very granular level. So we're approaching now our first panel discussion. We're a little bit behind time, but I think we're, we'll be able to catch up. Uh, we have six names slotted here, uh, but, and I've already mentioned them. I'm just going to introduce each speaker uh, individually and uh, just quickly, just with a name, the, each speaker will have six minutes to uh, offer thoughts, perhaps a slide or two, uh, but uh, to give input for six minutes. Uh, and then we will switch over to a mode of actual discussion, trying to integrate your comments as well. Each speaker will have an opportunity to maybe challenge or uh, uh, comment on what other speakers have said, and then we'll get into the actual discussion. So again, I encourage you to please submit your questions or, or com comments through Slido. Uh, I am able to access them here on my tablet, and I will try to integrate them into the discussion that's coming up. But first, let's get, get that input. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Yunus Omarji, the uh, chair of the European Parliamentary uh, Regi Committee. It's the Committee on, uh, Regional, on Regional Development. It's a videotaped message, uh, so let's listen in. Monsieur le ministre Claude Turmes, Madame la Présidente de la Commission Cotère, chère Nathalie Sarabézol, 
cher Marc Lemaître, directeur général de la DG Régio, madame la directrice Romina Boarini, monsieur Rodriguez Posé. À l'heure où nous entamons nos discussions, vous le savez, l'Europe est confrontée au plus grand déplacement de population qu'elle ait connu depuis la Deuxième Guerre mondiale. L'invasion de l'Ukraine par la Russie bouleverse l'Europe et nous n'en sommes qu'au début des impacts tout à fait vertigineux. La brutalité et la violence de cette guerre, nous partageons cette conviction, sont intolérables et nous devons à présent tout faire pour la stopper, pour stopper la Russie dans sa course folle et pour aider bien sûr les Ukrainiens. Dans cette crise majeure de notre histoire, bien plus qu'une crise en réalité, cet événement historique, notre regard se tourne aussi, bien sûr, vers toutes les régions et les villes qui organisent la solidarité, vers tous les États frontaliers de l'Ukraine et aujourd qui aujourd'hui accueillent et aident ce flot sans précédent de réfugiés. Spontanément, et devrais-je dire d'ailleurs, fraternellement dans la fidélité aux valeurs de l'Union européenne. Beaucoup ne savent d'ailleurs à ce jour comment financer les coûts qu'elles supporteront et c'est notre devoir que de leur apporter un soutien. Nous connaissons les difficultés budgétaires structurelles de certains territoires, de certaines de régions, de certains États et c'est pourquoi nous avons décidé avec la commissaire Elisa Ferreira de mettre sur pied le programme CARE qui permettra de réaffecter les fonds de la cohésion vers l'aide aux réfugiés dans les villes et les régions européennes. Cette facilité que nous voterons, je l'espère, la semaine prochaine en plénière fonctionnera sur le même modèle de la facilité que nous avions déployé pour aider à pallier aux difficultés engendrées par la pandémie du Covid. Et une fois de plus, nous affirmons que l'Europe et la politique de cohésion sait réagir vite lorsqu'il le faut et qu'à chaque fois, notre politique de cohésion est la politique par laquelle la solidarité entre les peuples européens se manifeste et se déploie. À la sortie d'une pandémie ravageuse sur tous les plans sanitaires, économiques et sociaux, toutes les régions d'Europe sont confrontés à de nombreux défis supplémentaires et sur des fronts aussi nombreux que la transition énergétique, le maintien de l'emploi, l'attractivité des territoires, la lutte contre les inégalités et la précarité. La guerre en Ukraine n'est pas une crise de plus, mais un événement historique majeur qui va profondément impacter les politiques européennes et le devenir même de l'Europe. Et dans ce bouleversement, la cohésion sera plus que jamais essentielle et partout, plus que jamais, elle sera attendue. Pour faire face à ces grands défis de la cohésion, des cohésions à atteindre pour l'Europe, les données fournies par ESPON, qui sont largement documentées, et qui ont aussi largement documenté la complexité de ces constats, contribuent de manière déterminante au travail législatif de notre Commission du développement régional. Car nous sommes, en tant que législateurs, confrontés à la réalité des territoires qui rencontrent des défis aussi multiples que complexes, des défis que nous devons pouvoir identifier, expliquer, pour répondre au plus près aux besoins des régions et des citoyens européens. Et les données que vous nous fournissez sont essentielles pour dresser un état de lieu, évaluer l'impact de nos politiques et pour bâtir les politiques de demain et avoir une vision très prospective de la politique régionale. Et elles ont été en réalité décisives dans l'architecture de la nouvelle politique de cohésion 2021-2027. Et je veux remercier euh, ESPON de nous avoir euh, adressé l'ensemble de ces euh, données. Et je ne doute pas qu'elles contribueront à la prochaine programmation pour lesquelles, vous le savez, les réflexions doivent déjà débuter. Dans cet esprit, j'ajouterai que la politique de cohésion ne doit pas 
rattraper seulement les écarts de développement. Elle doit aussi anticiper les mutations dans les territoires pour les armer à leur vulnérabilité et aux nouvelles vulnérabilités. Que ces fragilités s'expriment d'ailleurs aujourd'hui comme pour le futur et nous devons garder bien sûr pour cap, pour l'avenir, le, euh, la lutte contre les inégalités euh, territoriales. Je pense à la question des salaires qui euh, doivent devenir similaires et égaux dans toute l'Union européenne et nous en sommes en réalité encore très loin. Cette lutte contre les inégalités doit rester, je pense, un des moteurs du travail d'Espone et je sais en cela euh, pouvoir savoir compter sur vous. Mais lorsqu'on évoque le monde tel qu'il sera demain et l'Europe telle que nous la voulons pour demain, il serait absurde de ne pas évoquer la question du changement climatique. Notre commission du développement régional a fait des nouveaux règlements de la cohésion l'un des principaux piliers d'investissement pour le Green New Deal. Et je crois que c'est un grand acte moteur pour demain et nous devons être fiers de cette nouvelle, de ce verdissement en réalité de la politique de cohésion. Lorsque nous pensons la question du changement climatique, évidemment, nous pensons aux efforts en matière de la mitigation et de la réduction des émissions de gaz à effet de serre. Mais une politique climatique doit reposer sur deux piliers. À côté de la mitigation, des efforts doivent être renforcés pour l'adaptation. Et c'est pourquoi notre commission propose un nouveau fonds européen, un régional d'adaptation au changement climatique, question dont j'ai d'ailleurs pu discuter déjà avec Espon et je me félicite que vous êtes prêts à travailler sur une cartographie des risques naturels et des stratégies d'adaptation au changement climatique en Europe. Ce travail que vous réaliserez sera absolument central pour notre commission régie. En matière de climat, nous voyons aussi combien la transition énergétique nous oblige elle nous oblige plus que jamais, tant sur le volet écologique qu'en matière de justice sociale et plus que jamais d'indépendance énergétique et géostratégique pour libérer l'Union européenne des dépendances extérieures et en particulier d'une dépendance avec la Russie. Et ce que les, le FEDER met sur la table est une contribution, je crois, majeure pour atteindre cet objectif. Toutes ces crises sont interdépendantes et leur combinaison montre la complexité du défi qui est devant nous. Et ces crises interdépendantes doivent être mises en perspective. C'est le travail du programme ESPON de donner aux législateurs que nous sommes un certain nombre d'outils pour pouvoir bien légiférer et réglementer, et celui du politique de se saisir de ces outils pour résoudre à des équations à plusieurs inconnues. Devant la complexité donc, et devant l'urgence des crises auxquelles nous devons donc tenter d'apporter des solutions, nous avons plus que jamais besoin d'être éclairés par de solides analyses. Et c'est pourquoi ESPON est un partenaire absolument essentiel pour la Commission du développement régional. So, very interesting uh, inputs already, getting very strong uh, thematic trends coming through here, also a recognition of some of the current events, particularly the war and the what we just heard referred to as the largest displacement of people in Europe since World War II, but also uh, mentioning just how vital ESPON's work is for what's being done in the European Parliament, particularly in the Committee of the Regions. 
Uh, next with us, we have, I'm going to try to keep my commentary uh, very brief now because we're about 20 minutes uh, over our schedules right now. And I'm, I'm going to try, my job, part of my job is to keep us on track. So uh, less from me, more from our speakers. I would appreciate any, any effort uh, that's made to try to keep Keep, help keep us on time. Uh, we have Natalie Sarabazal with us now. Uh, she is chair of the Quarter, that's the Commission uh, for Territorial Cohesion Policy and EU Budget in the European Committee of the Regions. I understand she's going to address us in French, and uh, the floor is yours. Merci. Uh, merci beaucoup uh, à vous pour cette invitation uh, à partager des, des, des réflexions et à, à se projeter dans l'avenir. Euh, moi, je voulais témoigner du, du, euh, de l'excellent partenariat et des de excellents résultats de ce partenariat que nous avons euh, avec Espon. Et euh, je voudrais revenir après euh, le tableau qu'a dressé euh, M. Omardi sur euh, cette importance d'éclairer euh, euh, la décision politique pour qu'elle soit ensuite efficace. Et ensuite, ça s'était cité aussi dans, dans les différentes interventions, que euh, les citoyennes et les citoyens puissent euh, y trouver leur compte et d'un autre côté, puisse participer aussi au, au travail qui est fait. Donc, merci beaucoup pour ce, ce travail partenarial. Merci beaucoup aussi pour l'état d'esprit euh, dans lequel euh, vous vous trouvez quand euh, nous travaillons ensemble, puisque vous l'avez euh, dit, il y a déjà énormément de champs de recherche qui sont, euh, qui sont ouverts, mais vous êtes quand même euh, à l'écoute de ce que nous pourrions encore euh, apporter et, et demander comme, comme éclairage scientifique. Donc, merci beaucoup euh, pour tout ça. Depuis... Euh, depuis 2013 au Comité des régions d'Europe, depuis que nous avons finalement adopté l'avis d'initiative sur, sur l'évaluation des, des incidences territoriales, le Comité des régions a mis en place plus de, plus de 20 analyses d'impact territorial et ça souligne pour nous la nécessité d'éviter finalement l'aveuglement territorial des, des, des politiques décidées, puisque nous le savons, pour qu'elles soient efficaces et justes, ces politiques doivent être adaptées. Et pour qu'elles soient adaptées, il faut bien connaître les territoires sur lesquels elles s'appliquent. Et pour le, le Comité européen des régions, il s'agissait, euh, avec l'aide d'Espon, de promouvoir finalement une utilisation plus large des analyses d'impact territorial et notamment le quick scan d'Espon. Depuis lors, donc, Espon est notre partenaire qui finance également nos analyses. Et ce partenariat a été l'un des plus fructueux pour le comité des régions ces dernières années, car nous avons réussi à placer les analyses d'impact territorial sur le radar de la Commission européenne, qui a commencé à réaliser ses propres analyses d'impact territorial depuis 2017. Les méthodes utilisées par, la méthodologie utilisée par le comité des régions pour évaluer les impacts territoriaux a été l'outil développé par, par ESPON. Et conformément à notre stratégie, nous évaluons les impacts territoriaux si la législation évaluée présente un intérêt politique manifeste pour les collectivités locales et régionales, les pouvoirs locaux que nous représentons. Alors, ça, ça ne signifie pas nécessairement qu'il touche aux compétences des collectivités locales et régionales, mais qu'ils ont un impact territorial. Ce travail d'analyse d'impact territorial vient directement contribuer au, au processus de rédaction des avis du comité euh, suite à une initiative législative de, de la Commission européenne. Alors Parfois, nous, nous réalisons aussi des analyses d'impact territorial en dehors de la rédaction des avis. Et il s'agit pour nous euh, plutôt là d'être proactif et de préparer un avis futur sur une question particulièrement importante. Dans tous les cas, un problème récurrent que nous rencontrons c'est le manque de données au niveau euh, infranational, euh, ce qui fait euh, de notre travail en matière d'analyse d'impact territorial un défi, en quelque sorte. Et, euh, et je pense que c'est dans, dans, dans ce domaine euh, qu'Espon a été le plus utile et, et qu'Espon pourrait encore plus développer peut-être ses capacités au cours, au cours des prochaines années. Euh, Espon possède en effet, une, bien sûr, une grande expérience en matière de création d'outils d'analyse et publie des études qui ont été largement utilisées par les décideurs politiques. Et le Comité européen des régions est précisément euh, l'un de ses utilisateurs. La grande valeur ajoutée euh, d'Espon consiste à, à se concentrer sur les lacunes des statistiques officielles ou à présenter de nouvelles utilisations de données existantes. Et, et je sais que la plupart euh, des experts du domaine sont très prudents à cet égard et à juste titre. 
mais les décideurs politiques euh, veulent des données faciles euh, et compréhensibles qui puissent évidemment guider les politiques et éclairer aussi la communication politique envers les citoyennes et les citoyens des territoires. Ce qui signifie finalement deux choses, euh, des cartes et des indicateurs composites. Et c'est là euh, que, que Espon intervient, que vous intervenez, euh, bien entendu. L'objectif euh, à long terme au com du comité des régions, donc notre objectif à long terme, euh, c'est bien de rendre ces analyses d'impact territorial monnaie courante euh, dans l'analyse d'impact de la Commission européenne, étant donné euh, que la mise en œuvre de près de 70% de l'ensemble de la législation de l'Union européenne a lieu au niveau local et régional. Et, et les travaux de Espon sur la sensibilisation à la nécessité d'une dimension territoriale dans la législation de l'Union européenne, euh, les nombreuses études menées et la méthodologie développée sont reconnues et très appréciées par le Comité des régions ainsi que par les autres institutions de l'Union européenne. Donc, le comité des régions poursuivra bien entendu sa, sa coopération fructueuse avec ESPON pour promouvoir la dimension territoriale de la législation de, de l'Union européenne. Et nous poursuivrons certainement notre coopération en matière d'analyse d'impact territorial, puisque notre objectif, bien entendu, c'est de faire face aux crises, de tenir compte euh, du nouveau contexte créé par ces crises et de pouvoir nous projeter sur le long terme dans des politiques européennes qui répondent aux attentes et aux besoins des citoyennes et des citoyens européens. Merci. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for that input. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, also, to everyone else taking time to be to be with us today. Uh, the what we unfortunately, I I live in Germany. I speak German very well. My French isn't up to snuff in order for me to fully appreciate uh, what you, the points that you that you offered us. But perhaps we can recap that a bit uh, with the help of some of our our other uh, speakers today when we get to the discussion. Um, again, moving along, trying to keep up the, the time here, uh, we have our next speaker joining us, uh, Marc Lemaitre, uh, also will be familiar to many of you, Director General of the Regional and Urban Policy Director, better known as DG Regio, at the EU Commission. The floor is yours. Good morning, uh, Terry. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Um, Herr Minister, liebe Claude, um, liebe Timo, um, gute Morgen. Um, this was my contribution today to a place-based approach. Um, I also would like to uh, to greet uh, wholeheartedly uh, Victor as well as uh, all the uh, panel uh, members um, this morning. Um, I was very much inspired by um, uh, everything that was said uh, until now, uh, and I would like to um, uh, piggyback on uh, many uh, of the topics already uh, raised. Um, what is clear is that um, we are in troubled times, and troubled times are not easy for uh, policy making, policy shaping. But what seems essential uh, to us uh, when thinking about how to uh, deploy in the best way possible cohesion policy is not to forget the fundamental drivers of change. And uh, we need to keep these at the top of our minds uh, when um, uh, designing uh, cohesion policy approaches. And here, clearly, um, the uh, green and the digital transition um, uh, are uh, imperative um, uh, goals by themselves. When it comes to the green transition, um, the um, war in Ukraine has, if anything, um, uh, increased the urgency of the green and especially in the energy sector uh, transition. Um, and uh, COVID has uh, also um, emphasized that we need to gear up uh, towards the uh, digital uh, transition. Um, the cohesion report to which uh, Commissioner Ferreira uh, referred 
uh, also points to uh, one more uh, fundamental driver of change, uh, and that is demographic trends. Um, and as uh, several previous speakers already mentioned, uh, now with um, an uncertain um, addition uh, coming from the very high refugee flows coming from uh, Ukraine, which potentially might change uh, the uh, immediate demographic picture uh, of um, uh, vast uh, areas in, uh, in Europe. So keeping these fundamentals uh, in mind um, and acknowledging also all the um, surprising disruptive factors uh, which can affect us, um, I would also want to uh, pick up the notion of uh, resilience. Resilience is absolutely key uh, for the solidity, the stability uh, of our societies, of our democracies, and the link to democracy was uh, rightly made already. Um, and resilience in this context of uncertainty and of many shocks, um, including shocks which we want to drive, uh, because the green transition is, in many respects, a, um, a shock. Um, resilience requires uh, that we anticipate. Um, and uh, uh, here, uh, we need to anticipate in such a way that we um, focus on avoiding, uh, as Commissioner Ferreira said, uh, fractures within uh, societies and between uh, territories. And here, clearly, uh, a key notion uh, is to focus uh, on a just transition, which is not only true for green, but certainly uh, also uh, for digital. Um, and for this purpose, uh, what is clearly uh, indispensable is to re-inject in, or inject, <laughs> perhaps it was never sufficiently there, um, in public policy reflections, a sense of place. Um, to indeed avoid um, or uh, work on uh, places that don't matter. I um, use these terms uh, because uh, uh, Andres Rodriguez Pose is there and he has coined uh, this term, or to fight against indeed uh, the so called geography of uh, discontent. Now, um, there are certainly two key areas um, where ESPON, I believe, uh, can make an absolutely uh, key and decisive difference uh, over the coming decade uh, through its 2030 uh, program. One is on um, assessing a priori the impact of sec sectoral policies uh, on territories, the potential asymmetric impacts. These sectoral policies are a priori spatially blind, but they are clearly not spatially neutral, and light, more light needs to be shed on this uh, through territorial impact assessments. Uh, Ms. Sarah Bezoles uh, already emphasized that ESPON has already contributed through developing a toolbox here, uh, and I think that. Um, Further ESPON support in the future uh, will be uh, key uh, to anticipate on potential territorial impact assessment and to better um, integrate the notion for which Commissioner Ferreira always calls, which is the notion of do no harm to cohesion. So the best is not for cohesion policy to correct um, asymmetric impacts of other policies, but the best is to integrate upfront in, spatial, in, in sectoral policies um, 
uh, the, uh, the potential asymmetric territorial impact uh, and to uh, take account of them uh, up front. The second area where ESPON, um, um, I think, uh, can really uh, make a, a difference relates uh, to uh, its um, specific thematic action plan, which is it has called governance of new geographies. Um, let me just share my understanding of this and where I see this huge potential. Um, to me, um, we need to help member states, regions, local authorities to think beyond administrative boundaries, indeed, and to think functional areas. And these functional areas can have different sizes and shapes depending on uh, the, um, uh, the topic uh, concerned. Um, and here we, we need uh, some more uh, inspiration and some more push to define the right level of territorial uh, integrated intervention. The framework for cohesion policy 2127, I think is very flexible from that point of view under the so-called policy objective five, a Europe closer to its citizens. Uh, so member states can uh, define uh, very flexibly what intervention areas um, they, uh, they focus on. Um, and here, um, uh, ESPEN evidence and uh, inspiration uh, can only help to have the right territorial development uh, policies. Um, finally, let me congratulate uh, already uh, ESPON for its approach to developing its uh, program. I think it shows uh, in the quality of what has been presented uh, here. Uh, the participatory uh, and, and consultation approach uh, is, is very uh, laudable and I can only uh, encourage uh, to keep it up all along the uh, period. And finally, uh, I am also very pleased to see that uh, ESPON will see uh, its means uh, reinforced as compared to the past period. So our expectations uh, are uh, therefore uh, even higher. Thank you very much, uh, Marc Lemaitre. Uh, you are one of the four who will be participating in the, in the discussion that is coming up, so I appreciate your, your remarks. And uh, again, I would remind all of those joining us uh, right now that uh, if you want to submit a question, you can. Uh, again, there will be four, the last four speakers on your program uh, will be part of, these, of this panel discussion. So without f moving straight along, again, we are a little short on time here. Um, Romina Boarini, Director of the OECD's Center for Wellbeing, Inclusion, Sustainability, and Equal Opportunity. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, and thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I prepared uh, a couple of slides, and perhaps as the technical teams upload that on the system, I'll take the, the opportunity uh, to, to sort of uh, highlight how important uh, place-based policies and territories, territorial policies have now become in the uh, entire world that we do at OECD. In fact, you sort of think about how it was 10 years ago, perhaps there was just one department that was looking at this, and today, uh, actually, uh, local uh, local uh, economic development and again territorial policies have been mainstreamed so that shows uh, a trend that we're seeing in many many countries that really policymakers are understanding and appreciating uh, uh, increasingly every day more the importance uh, of territories but also that points out actually to one very important message from our work on inclusive growth uh, that we have conducted over uh, the last few years. And that message is that, you know, the, the trickle down economics just doesn't work. What we need is trickle up economics. And I think territorial policies approaches just, you know, have met that, that notion very, very strongly. So if I can see my slides, I'm not sure I can see them. Uh, what I wanted to share with you uh, before I go to perhaps providing comments on, on the Aspen approach, thank you so much, uh, is actually an illustration of why uh, place uh, based policies and analysis and evidence uh, to start with are so important. So uh, if you can kindly move on with my slides, and perhaps you can jump 
immediately to the third slide uh, that uh, offers actually uh, a piece of analysis or some, some highlights from some piece of analysis that we have done in the Wise Center. Uh, and yes, it's next slide, please. And that analysis essentially consists uh, of looking at the spatial inequality in multidimensional well-being uh, in France. So you have just, you know, uh, results from one uh, country in the OECD, but the uh, approach we have developed there is one that is very, very uh, close, I would say very coherent with what ESPEN usually uses. And this is about taking essentially uh, data that are collected at city and municipality level, and then uh, create composite indices. And so uh, the, uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, what I wanted to highlight is that essentially this study proved very interested not only to demonstrate you know, the, the extent uh, of uh, spatial inequalities in well-being, and again, talking about well-being is not just the sort of economic aspects of well-being, but also the non-economic aspects of well-being, but I think the most interesting result from this study is actually that when you look at the ways inequalities compound at territorial level, uh, you can also see that uh, those indices become very powerful predictors of uh, precisely uh, concepts such as resilience uh, or you know, the, the exposure uh, to be crisis. So in fact, through this study, we actually demonstrated that uh, in uh, the uh, regions, in the areas uh, where uh, the uh, levels of well-being were actually the lowest, uh, we have also observed uh, the highest uh, rate of contagion uh, and spread of, uh, of COVID and actually the highest mortality rates. So I think that, that is really providing uh, a sense of uh, the importance of this sort of analysis, not just from a study point of view in terms of understanding you know, and appreciating uh, you know, the, the fundamental sort of uh, changes uh, in, in societies, but also, uh, very importantly, how you can actually predict the capability of the system to, to react those, uh, to those changes. So again, uh, bringing in the territorial perspective definitely uh, is key for us, but it remains technically challenging, especially when it comes to the data that are multidimensional in nature, uh, and again, data that have to understand how the inequalities compound. Uh, across the fragile communities and territories. And this is an area that uh, the OECD is doing a lot of work on, and I'm very happy to actually uh, share the fact that we would like to partner with ESPON precisely on how we can best address, address those challenges. Uh, so uh, you know, we, we will start discussion in terms of what type of surveys, uh, comprehensive surveys could be uh, developed and implemented, but also for instance, how we can make the best use of other technical and statistical techniques that essentially match administrative data and interlink the, the available uh, data. And of course, uh, this is not just about statistical challenges. There is also the importance of doing uh, some other type of uh, analysis that can again uh, give us a sense at systemic level of how the, the various social and environmental and economic challenges are uh, sort of interconnected are sort of intertwined. Uh, and that is important, not just from a research analytical point of view, this is actually important precisely for the type of discussion we just had with many, many speakers, including the one uh, just before me, uh, explaining how it is important to understand how different sectorial policies uh, sort of uh, have, have an impact on, on the territory. And so, it, it, or for instance, other speakers talk about the importance of uh, going up with sort of uh, all of the government approaches, and so integrated approaches. And so again, it means essentially you can't just look at uh, challenges uh, in isolation. It's not just about uh, looking at economic or social environmental, but it's really about how uh, those uh, different elements are combined and have to be uh, integrated uh, by the policy decision. Uh, we think that uh, the work that the OECD and ESPEN are doing are actually fully complementary. Uh, we do uh, a lot of, as, as I said, of analysis that overlaps in terms of the dimensions, in terms of the perhaps content and, and topics. And I can see this also in the next program of the 2030 uh, ESPEN. Uh, however, again, these are uh, fully complementary, uh, at least for two reasons. First, because uh, in the OECD, of course, we don't only focus on uh, European countries, but we go sort of beyond and, and we cover many other countries. And uh, our work is uh, much less in-depth than uh, the one that ESPN does when it comes to Europe. So we think that in terms of sort of the geographical coverage, uh, our sort of respective organizations can really uh, join forces in a very, very uh, complementary and synergistic way. Uh, but the other piece I wanted to uh, also put forward in terms of differences and again, sort of elements of, of great element of diversity and complementarity is that I was very impressed by uh, the fact that the ESPN programs put so much uh, 
emphasis uh, on uh, engaging with stakeholders and, of course, uh, as FUN does it, you know, for instance, by consulting on the topics and the methods of work, this is great. But I've also seen ESPUN in action uh, through concrete projects, for instance, when it comes to measuring uh, quality of life of territories and actually asking the question to citizens. Uh, this is so important, uh, engaging with local communities. And again, this is another topic that was covered by many of us. Uh, that's the only way to make policies acceptable and therefore successful uh, you know, to citizens. And so we don't do that, uh, you know, uh, too much in the OECD. Of course, we try to, sort of, to also engage with the stakeholders, but we don't have direct channels, the direct infrastructure, direct networks that work with the citizens. And I see that as from, as that feature, and I consider that, you know, very, very strong element of the program and definitely something uh, OECD will uh, learn from and definitely will be happy to partner with. So uh, to conclude, and again, mindful of the very short time that we have, let me say in terms of the topics, in terms of the themes uh, that uh, the next vintage of ESPON is going to cover. First of all, I was very happy to hear uh, from um, Victor this morning that, of course, uh, some of the thematic packages, or perhaps, in fact, all of them, we have obviously to incorporate, uh, you know, the uh, consequences of the uh, Ukrainian uh, invasion. Uh, this is obviously, you know, one, one important element. This is the same for us at the OECD. I'm sure all of us are going to, to work on this, but uh, it's it's obviously a needed, I would say, um, aspect uh, of, of the work. And I've also seen that a lot of attention is placed on the notion of inequalities and the very first speaker in this session uh, reminded about the importance of that. And I have to say, that for us at the OECD, uh, it's not just about socioeconomic uh, inequalities. And, and so perhaps if I had to give a message in terms of uh, what additional uh, features uh, of the programs should be contained, I think it is important to remind that uh, you know, in Europe, we have this fantastic program called the, um, the Union of Equality. And that goes well beyond the notions that uh, equality uh, is only minimal from a socioeconomic point of view. This really speaks to the importance of fighting all type of discrimination. So I would definitely uh, invite uh, ESPON also to reflect upon those issues. And the final element also that I think it'd be interesting perhaps to strengthen a little bit more is uh, the role of social economy, social entrepreneurship, and in general trying to understand sort of how businesses uh, and all sort of uh, economic organizations are actually investing in their communities. Uh, we do quite a lot of work in that, uh, you know, in, the, in that area, the OECD, and again, that, that would be tech typically aspects where we would like to, to work together with, with ESPON. Thank you so much. Romina Boarini, thank you very much. Uh, and my apologies for bringing you in one speaker sooner than I, than I meant to. That was, uh, that was my error, and I, I claim that. Uh, so I have to also offer my apologies, not just to, to you, but also to Andres rodriguez Pozde, uh, who was scheduled to come in. And I simply overlooked the name in the program. And that's, uh, again, my, my apologies. Uh, Andres uh, rodriguez Pozde is professor of economic geography at the London School of Economics. and. The floor is yours. Uh, just one reminder to everyone at this point, we are about 30 minutes uh, behind schedule, so you know, any, any efforts that can be made to kind of keep us, help get us back on track would be much appreciated. The floor is yours, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, and no need to apologize. It was a pleasure to listen to uh, Romina there. Um, uh, what I'm going to start by saying is, uh, first, thanks for having me here uh, in the company of such uh, very good and very interesting speakers. And I would like to celebrate uh, the 20 years of uh, ESPON because since uh, 20, 2002, when it was created, ESPON has been pioneering in analyzing territorial trends and producing data and knowledge that have been fundamental in order to uh, provide policymakers with the adequate information to deal with good uh, policy. It has also been at the forefront of identifying the fundamental challenges, the environmental, the social, the economic, the technological and the governance challenges that have affected us uh, for the last 20 years, dealt with them from a territorial perspective, which is a novel type of approach and has been pioneering in issues like, for example, climate change and aging, the population migration, smart specialization, innovation, and issues like, for example, multi-level governance, the importance of uh, devolution, or the whole pro challenges or challenges that automation has created. In that respect, uh, I also welcome very much this idea that Expon is not just 
anchored in the past, but it's looking forward to the new challenges. And it's an Expont 2030 program. It has highlighted and it has highlighted very much as it's one of his main uh, aims, this green transition to a climate neutral uh, economy. Uh, but the important thing for me is not that it just covers it alone as it has been done in many other organisms, but it does actually uh, spouse it, combine it with this just transition, this just transition in terms of living conditions, in terms of opportunities for all people, regardless of where they live and with this territorial approach. Because what I'm going to try to highlight in the four minutes I have at the moment is this whole idea that the transition to a green and digital economy uh, that was underlined in her speech by uh, Commissioner Elisa, Elisa Ferreira, for example, is fundamental but may not happen if we overlook this sort of, let's say, economic and social dimension, this just transition uh, for all wherever they live. Because it's clear that climate change and environmental degradation are it's probably fun the fundamental challenge of uh, the 21st century for the whole of humanity. If we continue like that, we're going to probably have no world to live in in 50 or 100 years' time. And uh, the European Union, rightly so, has used the European Green Deal to set very ambitious targets uh, in terms of energy efficiency, in terms of energy and uh, renewable energy and carbon neutrality. However, the capacity of European countries and especially European regions and cities to implement this is variable. And uh, some places are moving much faster than, than others. So it is also happening that this, uh, let's say, um, energy or European Green Deal is happening in a place or in an area where we have already high ter territorial polarization in which a lot of vulnerable regions, regions that have been left behind, have been underperforming, not just in green objectives, but also many, let's say, middle income regions and some rich regions have been stuck in a regional development trap. They have been growing in terms of productivity, in terms of employment, in terms of um, just pure economic growth below what they were doing in the past and below what their peers in their countries and their peers in Europe are doing. And if we push forward with this uh, European Green Deal that we need to do, this is likely to produce regional winners and losers. The problem is that it never rains but it pours. The winners are likely to be past winners, the losers are likely to be losers in recent times. And it will have two types of impact. The first one is the direct impact. The direct impact of significant job loss in regions that produce the type of, let's say, brown energy that is no needed and no, no longer needed in tomorrow's economy. This is the case of, for example, the Lotsky region in Poland or Lausitz in Germany. And these regions have been already focused and targeted by the just transition funds. But I do think that the most and the biggest challenge is the indirect impact that uh, this European transition, green transition, the Green Deal is going to generate a factor reallocation that is going to have significant territorial consequences that need to be addressed. And this is what ESPON is doing at the moment. And what are these indirect impacts? The first one is that brown energies that we are now dismissing are labor intensive. Green transition type of energies are far more capital intensive. And what is going to happen is that we're going to destroy employment in areas that probably need it most, and we're going to generate employment in already dynamic areas, mainly the capitals, that the European Green Deal is very likely to produce very highly skilled jobs in core areas, very often at the high level in terms of research and development, which are very important jobs, but at the expense of destroying jobs in areas that are lagging behind or are development trapped, and that the benefits and costs are going to be very unevenly uh, distributed. There's going to be an acceleration of scale migration and brain drain from these areas that are losing out to capital and dynamic regions. They're going to be increasing negative externalities burdened on areas that have been suffering in the past. Uh, and that's going to create the idea that uh, some people are paying and others are winning from this uh, green transition and is going to be also high costs, for example, of new taxation, diesel taxes, for example, in places that have been seen their services and opportunities decline in places that, for example, 
20 years ago, where I told you you need to buy diesel cars at the population there. And now we have a higher tax on diesel. These are all necessary measures, but need to be accompanied by uh, some sort of adjustment, social, economic, and opportunity adjustment that is what Espon is doing. Because otherwise, we're going to end up having no green transition. Uh, Commissioner Ferreira, Mark Lemaitre has highlighted that this is creating this divide in which many regions and many cities and many people living there are reacting. And they are reacting with their votes. And they're saying, well, if we didn't no longer count, if we're going to suffer all the costs, we're going to vote for parties at the extreme of the political spectrum. And the main problem with this for the European Green Deal and for the green transition is that many of these parties are climate change deniers. So if we don't combine and we don't spouse this green transition with a just transition over a long period, um, we are going to end up without the capacity of addressing any of the goals of the green transition. We are going to end up with a Europe that is no longer capable of dealing with the process of climate change. And therefore, what I think ESPON is doing in its 2030 program is absolutely fundamental. Uh, the idea of bringing those two dimensions together, the green transition with the just social, economic and transition of opportunities, this idea of creating geographies and changing geographies, new geographies of opportunity is fundamental because it would provide the necessary foundations for a better and more resilient and more, let's say, equal Europe for people wherever they live across the continent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andres Rodriguez Pose, uh, for pointing out also the uh, you know, not just how important ESPON is in general, but also the sp specific challenge of addressing the twin challenges of the green transition and a just transition, which I believe was the first slide that uh, we, we had from Timo when the slide was, uh, was still working there at the beginning. So our uh, final speaker in this session, uh, is, has already spoken to us at the beginning. Some of you maybe have just joined us uh, in the meantime, so I will mention uh, who he is again. Uh, Claude Thomas is Minister for Energy and Spatial Planning for Luxembourg, and uh, that ministry actually hosts the ESPON Managing Authority, which is where we are coming to you from right now. So, uh, Minister, the floor is yours again. Thank you very much. and. Uh... So thank you for, for the input. So I, I will try to be sharp uh, and, and maybe uh, respond to what uh, Andres uh, mentioned. Um, I'm less skeptical than you are because I think that rural areas, uh, which are, have basically been often associated psychologically and maybe economically, with regions of despair or less well economic development, rural areas will be winners of the energy transition because the wind turbines will stand in rural areas, the big PV will stand in rural areas, and the carbon sequestration will bring new additional income to rural areas. The problem which you have, however, uh, I think a good point is, um, you have villages where a new wind turbine is is faced or is, is approached with hostility. So what I think is needed, and maybe that is something which which uh, we need to better understand, if this if both the energy transition, which potentially can bring new economic development to rural areas, but also the digitalization, and what we have uh, basically experienced during COVID, which was working from anywhere or from everywhere, if these two things together can, in a certain sense, stabilize the economic decline, which uh, huge parts of your rural areas have seen. And maybe that could be a good mapping. And the second mapping could be, of course, you have coal power plant in Europe, but I, I, I'm more, um, I have worked for 30 years on energy and only three years on spatial development. So <laughs> uh, 
Europe is largely an energy importer. So with the energy transition, we will reduce oil imports. We will reduce gas imports. So coal, which was maybe a 15% share of our energy, will be replaced by 80 or 90% renewables. So de facto, in, a, in an economy which, is, which has been a major importer of fossil fuels, with renewables, we create value in Europe. And we, of course, we will maybe create hardship in, um, in some of the oil exporting countries or in Russia, uh, if it is no more able to export gas. But for Europe as a whole, energy transition from a pure job and economic, uh, it is a positive story. So, but what Aspen could do is de facto where will this new economy thrive? And of course, you will have the traders, the innovators in, who will live in Copenhagen, Barcelona, and in Paris, and in Berlin, where, but for example, offshore wind will bring thousands, tens of thousands of jobs to Gdansk, to Gdina, to Schweiz, to Bremerhaven, to Le Havre, to, to uh, Basque country, so to places which were in decline over the last 20, 30 years. But maybe we have to map this, but I would not be as negative uh, as you were, uh, Andres. Um, the other thing is, of course, uh, I think uh, urban areas and mobility will, will, will change dramatically and, and we uh, we will have to, to, I think the cities will have, will look completely different. So the city of the 15 minutes will have a different sociology than this, the city of uh, Le Corbusier uh, and driving in uh, over 50 and 80 kilometers. And I think that's also something we, where we need to understand what is the spatial uh, dimension uh, of that. And, and then, of course, uh, this uh, cartography of the climate risks is important. I think there will be areas of Spain, of Greece, of Italy, uh, but also the very co the, those countries which have continental climate, like Poland, uh, will be deeply affected by changing uh, climate or weather patterns. And I think we have to anticipate what that means uh, for 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 these areas. Um, and maybe a last remark. Um, I think one of the fundamental problems of our times is um, the, the inventing new forms of democracy. And we need a diff we need a new approach to participatory to participation. And we need to better integrate stakeholders. But then, when it comes to implementing planning or spatial planning on the ground, I think we need much more citizens' participation. And maybe Espon could also um, basically map a bit what kind of ex positive and negative experience do we have over Europe in, in successful or less successful public participation. Because social media, with its algorithms, is creating division. So we need fora where you can have informed discussions where you create consensus. And, and I think these fora are probably more physical based than digital based. And planning and planning decisions are, uh, I think, very important to be combined with this kind of participatory or democracy and, and new tools of, uh, of uh, democracy. The last aspect, uh, functional areas is extremely important. I give you the example of Luxembourg. We have an economy with 400,000 uh, jobs and 200,000 of these 400,000 are living outside our borders. And so the labor, the, the labor flows, the labor territory has of course an impact on the spatial territory, on, on the mobility territory, uh, or the mapping of mobility, uh, the geography of mobility. This uh, geography is, of course, then also on housing, on the economic flows. So I think 
moving from uh, having governance for fixed political administrations to uh, basically functional areas and, and imagining new governance for areas which are not, uh, which are closer to the real life than to the political boundaries. I think that is very important also. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I appreciate you also, uh, Claude Thomas, uh, picking up on the previous speaker's uh, statements and already kind of getting the discussion going, as it were. Uh, now, we're, in a, we're facing, a, you, know, a, a, you know, if we would have a large round of applause right now for all of, all of the speakers we just heard from, uh, this being a virtual event, I, I will simply uh, you know, motion here to all of you. Thank you very much for your input uh, collectively. Um, we are quite far over time. We were originally planning at 11.45 to go into a, a half-hour break. Uh, we will not be taking a half-hour break. We will, however, still take a 10-minute uh, a break, a short break. But before we do, I would like to give uh, the speakers an opportunity, if they, if they wish, to uh, challenge an idea for another, another speaker, as we just heard uh, I heard, uh, first of all, Claude Thomas doing, or um, if there's, Thomas, uh, or if we, I have, a, I have a question from the audience that seems to be uh, burning as well. So any, uh, any rebuttals, any counterpoints uh, talked from the speakers? If so, raise your hand. I thought there might be, yeah. Um, so let, let's, let's indeed allow uh, a, a uh, re return comment there from Andres Rodriguez Pose to what uh, I suspect Cl uh, Claude Thomas just said. Let's see if we can get your microphone. There you are. I think uh, on the whole, we are in agreement. Um, the green transition is absolutely necessary. And the green transition is going to, going to generate in the long term a uh, massive amount of new employments and new opportunities for people across Europe. But the problem here, I think, is a transition, is the whole idea that where the effects are going to be in the short term. And there's where I would uh, disagree with your view. First, this is not, uh, I, I don't want to emphasize, this is not a rural versus urban type of division. Um, it's uh, a big city versus, or more dynamic city, capital city regions versus the rest. In fact, if we take a look at uh, growth in the European Union over the last 27, at a quarter of a century, um, 25 out of the uh, 27 capitals of the European Union have been the fastest growing regions or among the top five regions in their, in their countries above the average. Um, by contrast, in a country like France, all other regions uh, have grown below uh, the national average. This is not um, the norm everywhere. In Germany, for example, you have that uh, medium-sized cities have done that particularly well. But it seems to be the situation we see in France, more of the norm than the situation we see in Germany. And we, let us not forget that although in the long term, uh, the green transition is going to create employment everywhere, in the short term is going to lead to more concentration of jobs in research and development. You mentioned also markets, which are not going to be located in the areas where you say you have a green turbine, but that's normally regarded as a as a, a negative externality, and let's not kid us. If the right-wing political parties, uh, not the, sorry, not the right-wing, I just said, uh, the anti-system uh, political parties to the right of the spectrum are capitalizing on um, this idea that we are going to oppose the green transition and they're getting their votes in this declining, long-term declining areas is because they have identified a market. And we have already an example of what has happened. The Gilets Jaunes uh, revolt was fundamentally an anti-diesel tax in declining areas, places like La Nieva, which is not just rural, it's medium-sized cities declining. That has put um, France before the pandemic against a wall. And we have another key example that I want to highlight, which is the backlash we have now against globalization. We would all agree, possibly many of us agree, that globalization on the whole, in the long term, has been beneficial for the economy, has been beneficial for individuals wherever they are. And in the case of the UK, globalization has been generally beneficial for the whole country. It has created more jobs over the last 30 years than it has destroyed. The problems are where those jobs have been created and where they have been destroyed. It has created, according to our calculations, 1.2 million jobs in London and the southeast of England. 
which is perfect. It has destroyed one million jobs in the north. The re return or the result of that has been the revolt of these places that increasingly were considered and were told that they did not matter, that voted for Brexit. And as a result of that, and I live in the UK, most of us in the places that we're already losing behind in the so-called red wall, in places like London, in the whole of the UK as a result, are losing out. So let's not repeat the same mistake twice. I think Espon is doing the right thing. Uh, we need a green transition and we need it fast, but we need to make sure that we adopt the measures to make sure that the green transition is also just from an economic, social, and uh, let's say governance point of view. Andres, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, thanks very much for, for that input. Um, I see that we've that uh, Natalie Sarbazal has her hand raised, and uh, I, would, I would like to bring her in at this point. Uh, again, if, uh, appreciate any sort of brevity that can help get us back on, on track here. Um, th the floor is yours. Merci. Oui, je vais être très bref. Je voulais juste uh, appuyer finalement ce qui vient d'être dit uh, pour redire que, quels que soient les défis que nous avons à relever, nous aurons à les relever avec la population, avec les gens. Et, et donc, c'est la nécessité pour eux de voir la justice dans les décisions qui nous permettra de les emmener avec nous. Euh, la, la, la question du mouvement des Gilets jaunes a été euh, évoquée. C'est euh, tout à fait l'exemple de ce qui euh, pourrait paraître comme une décision juste et éclairée, mais qui touche plus fortement une partie de la population qu'une autre et qui entraîne... Euh, ensuite, une difficulté de cohésion. Donc, euh, euh, bien connaître les territoires, bien connaître les, les, les besoins des personnes qui vivent dans ces territoires et aussi leurs capacités, leurs ressources, c'est la condition pour réussir à relever euh, les, les défis qui sont devant nous. Et donc, une très bonne analyse et une très bonne connaissance de ces territoires et, et de ces personnes, ça nous permettra d'aller de l'avant euh, et, et de garder à la fois euh, la cohésion et, et finalement... Euh, les bases saines d'une bonne démocratie européenne pour relever ces défis. Merci beaucoup pour votre invitation et merci à tous. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Um, we, un, un, unless there is another you know, burning need to, to, to make a comment at this point, I'm going to suggest that we adjourn for 10 minutes uh, and ha have a break. Uh, we've, we've, been, we've heard a lot of input. We've gotten a lot of uh, ideas. We also have a few questions coming through on Slido, which are, are very valuable, but they tend to be directed more towards ESPON itself, and I'd, I'm going to bring those questions in uh, towards the second part of it when we might be able to uh, integrate some of the, the people from ESPON itself. Um, I'm sorry, there's a... Um, go, go ahead, Tima, I believe you have some... Oh, there's someone else has a hand raised? Sorry, I didn't, didn't see it. Okay. Ah, okay. And I think the, the lighting is such that I can hardly see at this point. Then, uh, Romina, please, uh, yeah, please comment. I didn't, I didn't see your hand. Sorry about that. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to, to second what actually the, the last two speakers said in terms of what they need to sort of accompany the people, and uh, and in that sense, I think it's very, very important that Espon uh, really coordinates uh, well with what other European programs are doing, and and it's so important to ensure that again the, there is a very very neat intersection between territorial policies and the other type of you know green and just transition policies that, that Europe is walking around. So it seems to me that that really that lies at the core uh, of, of uh, the approach that ESPO should take. And you know, I, I've seen many uh, you know elements in the in the packages and the presentations of the programs that really speak to that necessity of a strong coordination. Uh, again, to ensure that, uh, that that we're not looking at territorial policies so, so as you know an interesting um, isolated fact, but this is part and and really sort of a. Uh, front and center uh, of all of the entire sort of uh, Green Deal approach that Europe is taking. Thank you very much. Um, thanks again to all of our speakers, and uh, sorry about the, the time constraints, but we really should take, take a short break so we can come back refreshed for the second part of our program, because we do have an, a number of uh, very good speakers again coming up. We're also going to be hearing uh, more from Timo and Victor, elaborating on some of the ideas we've had. But the second part of our conference today is going to be looking very much ahead to the implementation part when we look at 
ESPON 2030, what's coming up, how it can be done, how do we get all the stakeholders who have, have a reason to participate in this uh, get their voices heard so that evidence can be produced that is indeed most valuable for policy making. So uh, thank you very much to all of everyone we've heard from so far. It is now, according to my time here, uh, is Central European time, 11:17. Uh, we're going to break 11:18. We're going to break until I'd say 11:30. Uh, so 11:30 uh, in 12 minutes, I'll see you back here at uh, at the conference. Thank you. Hello and welcome back to our conference from ESPON 2020 to ESPON 3030, coming to you from Luxembourg. My name is Terry Martin, if you're just joining us. We've had a very exciting session this morning, heard from lots of uh, good speakers, helping us uh, understand where ESPON is coming from and where it's going and how to get there in light of the tremendous challenges that uh, the European Union is facing at this point. Uh, and those challenges extend, well, I'm not going to go into those because we'll hear more about them in the next few minutes. This second part of the conference is going to be more interactive than the first part. We're not going to hear quite so many speeches. We're going to try to get more of a discussion going. And we're going to be looking specifically, looking ahead at uh, the implementation of the program uh, moving, moving forward about the, in, the uh, ESPON 2030 program. The, uh, the purpose of the session is to be, again, a little more interactive. We're going to be looking at which evidence, for whom, and uh, how to deliver it to policymakers. And of course, it involves all, all the stakeholders, indeed. We're going to, I'm going to introduce a, our panelists in just a moment, but we're going to kick things off by, uh, by bringing Victor back in, uh, who is very much involved with the implementation of the ESPON uh, strategy and the, the ESPON uh, program. Uh, Victor, of course, you heard, if you were with us this morning, he helped to present the overall uh, ideas about where ESPON is headed and what its different thematic action programs are, its various work streams and what the priorities are. Uh, and he's going to, to talk to us now more about the thing that he's actually doing within his part of the organization, and that is uh, implementation. So uh, let's start, Victor, by you having telling us a little bit just what your general vision is for for trying to implement these ideas that you just you and Timo described to us this morning in terms of the thematic action programs and exactly um, how you imagine ESPON 2030 being put into action. Thank you, um, Terry. Indeed, uh, this is not an easy job to implement uh, a program at such a complexity of topics and themes, and also. Uh, a very clear uh, interest in ESPON services as expressed by many of the, uh, the speakers in the, in the past panel. And our role is to take all of this through the notes we are taking, through the different ideas that emerge from the different consultation uh, structures we've, uh, we've initiated, and also the, uh, the accumulated knowledge in our organization, ESPON EGTC, now to bring it to the uh, rollout stage. And uh, I would say I, I see our role in, in three specific buzzwords here. Connecting, because we are trying to facilitate the dialogue, the exchange between policy makers, policy stakeholders in, in general, and researchers and practitioners as well on how we could better serve the policy makers with the good, reliable, robust, territorial evidence and data. Second area is to inspire, because we are expected to bring something new into the picture of decision making, be it through innovative methodologies, being through involving citizens in participatory processes that we can demonstrate through the ESPON thematic activities or projects, through then bringing the people from different sectors, from the different territorial levels, and also with different experiences together, to mutually inspire them for doing something in a better, smarter uh, way, also closer to citizens. And the third one is to show new horizons. This could be something that the policies have not dwelled upon so far. 
Can we find something new, something that we could, in an agile way, then predict and anticipate to bring into the scene for the, uh, the policies, be it for territorial dimension of sectoral policies, a wider dimension of European policy making as such, so the global look, or more granular approach to see how the local organizations, the community groups, may work together hand in hand with policy makers and researchers in finding what is best for them so that the policies are not spatially blind. So this is what we are going to offer with the wide array of thematic activities as presented in the first, in the first set of slides. The different evidence production activities and also different knowledge development services. But what we want to do is to be smarter, quicker, closer to policy makers, and also then to be able to focus more on what the real needs are, well-timed ESPON support for policies. This is the mantra of today. Now, ESPON has been around for 20 years. Uh, it's been working through different you know, programs al along that time, and, and the European Union has changed, has evolved. ESPON has had an opportunity to evolve. Um, I know that you've not been with ESPON for 20 years, but you've, you're very familiar, obviously, with its operations. You've now been in working with, within ESPON for uh, uh, you know, moving on towards two years um, as director of the, the part responsible for implementation. When you look at where ESPON is now compared to where ESPON was, say, 10 years ago, what, what's different? What's different in the, as a result of the consultation and as a result of the production of this new 2030 uh, program for, for ESPON? How do you say, you say you want it to be smarter and quicker and closer to the policymakers? Um, can you give us some, maybe some concrete example of how that might happen? Well, I would say uh, on the uh, scales between you know, research and policies, we are actually shifting our attention onto policies. So we want to see the, the policy stakeholders and as service recipients for ESPON. And we are shaping our future activities based on very specific policy needs that ESPON could, not necessarily will, but could be the right tool to provide this sort of a new knowledge, new understanding, new explanation of facts, figures, trends, challenges, and so on and so forth. So what we are going to offer, maybe in a little bit of contrast to what was 10 or 15 years ago, we are not just arena for researchers and practitioners to speak freely about the challenges, but we are an organization dedicated to serving policy needs, supporting them in the way on, I would say, on their terms. So not doing something for policy makers and researchers, but with them. So this with feeling will be very important for the policy stakeholders to understand. We are all ESPON. We are, ESPON is not here sitting in this ministry or across the street. We are all ESPON, and we need to think ESPON together. Okay. Um, Timo, any, do you want to, uh, any further comments on that yourself, uh, Timo, before no, we I, introduce No, I think your, your, your question uh, about what, what happened in the last 10 or 20 yeah. years, actually, is I think we, we got a much better, I mean, firstly, the environment was changing and we got a better understanding. I mean, when we start first uh, with the ESPON, there were hardly any pan-European studies available. So we, we had uh, to do really groundwork on territorial studies, which capture the whole territory. And we, we um, I think, we, we really created a market, but at that time we were doing the studies and then afterwards we were asking uh, whom could that interest. So, uh, and now we, uh, we are working in an environment where there is much more research done and we um, actually can allow ourselves to say, okay, here's this, here's that, maybe there is a gap in order to make this usable for policy makers. And I think this is the niche where we are now looking at. And therefore, we also try to be much closer in dialogue with the policy makers with the, to understand the policy processes that on the one side, we, we may do address basic new questions, but on the other side, we may take existing research 
put it together, but then focus more on the delivery side. And I think we really now have a, a new quantum <laughs> jump, if I may say so, in, in that regard, uh, uh, working on these work streams, thematic action plans, where we combine evidence production with the knowledge development. Just one comment on that, perhaps, because we talk about, we use this, you know, paraphrase of thematic work streams, but streams means flows. So ESPON needs also to resemble a meandering river. So, you know, in this dynamic situation, new needs, new gaps, new evidence needed, new context for development, we need to accommodate our service, our supply, our offer. So we are in this sort of a quite a interesting, you know, market position, I dare say, that uh, this ongoing process of collecting the needs will also have to accommodate that the needs will be changing all the time. And we need to change our offer to actually tailor it to the specific needs. One of the things that interests me uh, working in both journalism and in research communications is the uh, slightly iconoclastic approach of, of ESPON where it looks beyond administrative boundaries and this whole notion of uh, functional space, uh, the way you look at things is, is not necessarily the orthodox way of, of breaking things down and looking them. And I think that there's growing uh, reception and appreciation for that as we move forward. Okay, um, I'm going to introduce our panel now. Uh, this panel is, again, a, supposed to be an interactive session. So if you're, if you're just joining us, uh, please do make use of the Slido function within your internet interface there that allows you to ask questions or to make comments and I'll, we'll try to pick up on those uh, in our discussion series. I will also pick up on a couple of points that were made during uh, the morning part that we weren't able to get into our, our discussion this morning because of time reasons. So uh, keep in mind who's on the panel when you uh, offer your, your questions and maybe address them to a specific person. I will introduce our panelists now. Uh, the panelists, by the way, are going to give a quick opening statement, uh, six minutes max. I would appreciate if you could stay on time. It's very difficult in this interactive online session to intervene. So uh, I, I will respect your honor in, in trying to stick to time. Uh, I'll quickly mention all of their names and functions, and then I'll, I'll introduce you each individually. We have uh, six, uh, five people on the panel, rather, uh, starting with Duarte Rodriguez, uh, Vice President of the Portuguese Cohesion and Development Agency. Nicholas Brooks, conference from the Conference uh, of Peripheral Maritime Regions, uh, the CPMR. Uh, Peter Austin from the Urban Development Department of Oslo City. Uh, Luke Berlins. Uh, Good to see you again, Luke, wherever you are. Uh, leader of Transitional Outreach of the ESPON Contact Point Network, so there's an ESPON insider. And uh, marie Lorraine uh, Danjard, I hope I pronounced your name right, uh, chair of the ESPON Monitoring Committee. Again, someone very much uh, associated with ESPON. So, uh, without further ado, six-minute uh, quick inputs from the, six, uh, from the five of you, starting with Duarte Rodriguez. Good morning to everyone, and it's very good to, to be here in this debate with so familiar faces. And let me start by thanks the invitation to take part in this event. Not a little challenge from my old colleague, Tiemu, to give a non contributions on as from a policy perspective, from a policymaker perspective. I would like to underline the relevant work from Expone over the, the past 20 years on raising public and political awareness on the territorial dimension of public policies. We all know, but I think we need to remind over the over all days that specificities of territory are cause and even consequence of different assets, different development trends, grabs, trends, gaps, sorry, and, and traps also, and requires different multi-level governance mechanisms. The research work from Expone has been and will continue to be an important input for a better understanding of these specificities and for peer learning across the area. More focus on the, the challenge ahead and this perspective on the, the thematic action plans. I would like also to underline the very promising approach on the building of these pillars of these thematic action plans. So the mix of uh, robust creation of evidence, as you say in your, in your presentation, uh, fill the gaps either on research and policy awareness. Uh, as I said, the mix of this creation of evidence to knowledge transfer 
to, to policymakers. I think this flow that Vitor already talked talk about a few minutes ago, it's quite, quite relevant. And also on this policy-driven research, if I can use this word, uh, I would like also to underline the relevance of the scenario approach. Uh, Andreas talked about this topic on managing the, the transition. And I think the scenario approach is quite relevant for policymakers to anticipate the future, to anticipate the transition, the transformation, and to be well equipped to manage them in a more fair way, or if you want, the more common word uh, uh, over the current day, so the just transition process. Thinking on and uh, thinking from a policymaker uh, with a, a long experience on cohesion policy and region of in Portugal, I would like to underline uh, to start with this conversation for challenge from the demand analysis, what you call demand. In, in region of development, we are mixing uh, the relevant topics uh, that came from, uh, or if you want, non-solved territorial change previous to the pandemic, with the new arising from the post-pandemic and also on the more current uncertainty and even unsecure world. So I'd like to, to underline four challenges on these topics. The first is the idea that we need to understand better uh, uh, trends, ideas, so to provide new evidence about the ability of territories on to deal with the twin transition. Twin transition was a challenge before the pandemic and became even a major challenge after the pandemic. So different territories, different political and administrative boundaries, different administrative frameworks need to be analyzed, need to be provided with different toolbox uh, for tailor-made solutions. Uh, just to give an example, the work on Expo, on the past work and the future work on the way of providing social service in different territorial contexts will be, in our view, in my own view, a critical topic for the digital and climate transition across Europe. So this idea on to manage in a tailor-made approach the twin transition, it's not a new, but it changed a little from the, the, the post-pandemic world. The second topic is the role of the mid-side cities in, in, in uh, um, being a pillar for the urban networks in different member states. The urban fabric in the EU is not homogeneous, uh, and then uh, I think it's a very good uh, way of uh, expand contributions to that. The role played by these urban poles to structure the interland and to attract population and investments is essential to guarantee that no place is left on PI. I think we have uh, among us Andreas that is a, a long research on that topic. I would like to, to underline this topic because the relevance of the urban, link, urban rural linkage is, is bigger than ever. The dichotomy approach on urban versus rural, I think it's, there is a consensus that is now, nowadays outdated. So let's think on the urban rural linkage to solve some territorial problems. The third topic on the cross-border cooperation. Uh, I think there is a room for understanding and better uh, and better uh, knowledge about the way uh, the, the, the cross-border territories could be used to speed up the develop, development of these territories and to be in some areas and uh, living labs for innovative solutions, social provisions, uh, like social provision, so social service provision, sorry, economic development, climate change combat, and digitalization. So uh, I, we need to think uh, better at, at the role of cross-border cooperation. And last but not the least, um, we need to think on the new patterns coming from the post-pandemic world and new, and new geopolitical risks. Andreas already stressed, and I would like to underline that topic, that the pandemic changed a lot um, the way we are facing the digital transition and probably the current uh, um, war will change a lot the way we are facing the climate transition and mainly the energetic issue. So, and there are lots of things that we, we already don't know nowadays. The global impact of the remote working on rural and urban places is a big question mark for all. And I think ESPON can play a very important role. And there are thematic action plans that Peter and Tiemo explained this morning, quite relevant for that. 
the strategic autonomy of, of Europe was an issue after the pandemic, mainly on the global value change, and is nowadays a big issue on the energy production and the industrial production also. So uh, just to, to, to keep uh, in, uh, in the time that the, the, the moderator gave me, I will stop here on the underlying these four areas, and then I will leave the challenge or the knowledge transfer for the second part of this, this debate. So to underline the idea of managing drink transition, the urban rural linkage, the second topic, the cross-border place is the third topic, and this better knowledge about the territorial impact of new trends like remote working, global value change, uh, and so on and so forth. Thank you very much, and I'll be available for the debate. Thank you, uh, Duarte. Thank you very much for that, uh, getting getting the ball rolling, as it were, and for keeping uh, keeping time. Uh, you, you get a you get a gold star for that one uh, to to go along with those gold stars that are already behind you. I really do appreciate that. It it helps everyone uh, if we're we're a little disciplined in that respect. Since then we can get more more lively, interactive conversation uh, going on, and that's uh, also what this is about. So thanks thanks for getting us going. Our next speaker, Nicholas Brooks from the Conference uh, Peripheral. Maritime regions. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, challenge accepted. I'll try to stick to time. <laughs> um, just to present um, uh, the CPMO in a nutshell. So we're all an organization representing 150 different um, maritime regions in Europe from EU members and non-EU members. We're essentially a political and lobbying association um, so that you understand where we're coming from. Um, and just to present a little bit the issues that we're working on right now, um, so that you get a flavor of what we do and how uh, we um, work with ESPON. Um, so we're working on the territorial dimension and regional inv involvements um, in the EU recovery plan, complementarity uh, in terms of the EU investment policies and the articulation of uh, um, ESI funds, structural funds with other EU funds for the current programming period. We're working a lot on the implementation of cohesion policy because a lot of our members are actually managing authorities of, of EU funds, ELDF and ESF. We're working on the European semester. Um, so you can see a lot of focus on cohesion and, and um, cohesion policy and the EU recovery plan. But we're also working a lot on transport. Uh, we're doing a lot of work on mapping territorial accessibility, for example, the future of 10T, uh, the Fit for 55 package as well as well as uh, we have a big maritime focus as well, focusing on the future of common fisheries policy at the moment. Um, and finally, uh, and that's actually quite a big priority for us at the moment, migration uh, when it comes to regions actions and when it comes to integrating migrants and refugees. Um, in terms of the way that we use, uh, so to speak, ESPON, we really, really value the work uh, of ESPON and the territorial evidence that it provides to our advocacy lobbying work for lack of a better term and to give you an example of reports that were particularly useful to us the territorial scenarios for 2050 that was published uh, in 2016 policy brief on territories with specific geographical handicaps um, the recent policy briefs on transport for example um, those those are examples of work where we've directly integrated uh, the evidence and also the conclusions of those reports in, into our work um, so we really value uh, ESPON's work in that regard. In terms of areas where we think um, ESPON should provide support, and I'm very, very happy that, that a lot of the things I'm about to say were already mentioned by previous speakers. Um, the first one for us would be, and that's something Marc Lemaitre said earlier, the uh, do not harm cohesion principle. As Marc has already pointed out in the eighth cohesion report, there is uh, an introduction of a very interesting principle to do not harm cohesion. Um, the challenge is now to translate that at policy level. Um, and indeed, as has been said already, we are keen that this principle goes beyond cohesion policy because it's a policy that already addresses uh, cohesion, uh, territorial cohesion, of course. Um, so we would like, um, if you like, Espon, to, to perhaps look at this principle and see how that could translate into policies like transport policy, the review of the 10T 
proposal is, is a good um, uh, hook in that regard. Um, but also other policies like climate change and energy. Um, and uh, and, and I'm, I'll give you an example, the alternative fuels infrastructure regulation, which is part of the 55, 55 package. Uh, it's an important and key objective for sustainable transport, but we might need to see how the implementation of that regulation um, does not exacerbate regional disparities. So again, this is something that where we might need um, a sponsor support uh, there. Um, other areas that are very important for us, the European semester, I don't think a lot has been said about that, but uh, clearly the EU economic governance has a very kind of top-down uh, dimension to it. And we would like, um, uh, we, we, our message to the, to the European Commission is that it should uh, promote economic, social and territorial cohesion and involve, and involve regional authorities uh, for relevant investment guidelines. And, and we think that uh, perhaps we need more territorial evidence to support that claim. Um, the RRF, the Recovery and Resilience Facility, um, clearly it's a game changer. Uh, where we were very supportive of the RRF, but we would like to see where the funding will be spent, on which sectors, and the extent to which it will contribute or not to territorial cohesion. Um, and finally, uh, just to finish up on how we can work better and how we can uh, collaborate uh, better with ESPON in the future. Um, again, we think that um, the, the one thing that we would advise um, uh, the excellent uh, team at ESPON to do is to perhaps um, focus the timeline of your excellent policy briefs um, a little bit better with the EU agenda um, and which so that so that we can utilize your your the conclusion of your report a little bit better and maybe just a final point on on language um the language of the uh of, of the report is uh, i mean the, jo the jargon <laughs> that uh, the eu jargon should be the same uh for uh, espon to be even more influential than, than it is already some of the conclusions that are emanating from the reports for example uh, just to give you an example the report um, from 2017 on uh, territories with specific geographical handicaps very helpfully um, stated that we needed more targeted indicators beyond not three so that's something that we use and relate uh, to towards the european parliament but other conclusions are perhaps a little bit more difficult to exploit uh, at legislative level again i'm saying that because we're a lobbying organization so i'm just keen to um, uh, to exploit and to work with Espon even uh, more than we do already. I'll stop here. Um, I hope I didn't exceed my speaking time. And it's a huge pleasure to be with us, to be with you today. Sorry. Nicholas, thank you uh, also for, for pointing out the need to, or the, the value of, of coordinating uh, policy recommendations, for example, maybe in a policy brief with the legislative cycle. It's something that uh, I've been advocating, not to ESPON so much, but just in general uh, in some classes I've been teaching over the years. So um, Peter Austin joins us now. Uh, Peter Austin is uh, urban development uh, with the Urban Development Department in Oslo City. Uh, thanks for being with us. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation from uh, the, the team for ESPON. Uh, nice to meet you, Victor. And uh, team, of course, uh, very kind of you to invite me. I'm, I'm representing the city of Oslo, but also uh, through EuroCities, the network of 150 plus cities across Europe. Uh, we work very closely uh, and uh, we've uh, been very pleased to work uh, together with ESPON in the last uh, period. Uh, I've, I've a number of points I'd like to raise about how to get things done. And then if we have time, just a very short list of uh, some of the themes that we would like to focus on. Uh, I think initially it's important to think about this whole knowledge transfer process, which is your big question in this, uh, Victor. Uh, technology transfer agencies already exist. Uh, they struggle with this across specific industries, but in public policy, the challenge is a lot bigger. Uh, this is due to the complexity and the need to address non-economic goals. It's quite different from tra uh, technology transfer within the business sector. So ESPON should see the results perhaps more as a catalyst for change rather than a, a, a recipe for in direct introduction across cities or across regions. 
And then we need, as you say just now, to, to, to use the existing policy processes, which would include the role of networks, as you've also highlighted, and NGOs, which are already able to promote local and specific interests. Looking at the, the way to get this technology transfer to work better, reality is complex, especially in uh, cities and regions. There's no one size fits all. So policies have to be adaptable and, and beneficial to places where they are. Uh, this, in my view, makes, makes cross-cutting research essential. Uh, I think in, in all the projects that are initiated here, we need to involve other DGs because they're often very uh, influential in, in the policies that come out of this. And across other sectors, we have other programs such as the urban agenda, territorial agenda, new European Bauhaus has been mentioned just now. Focus on the stakeholders is, is, is crucial. They are the key players to develop and interpret and adapt ESPON results to inspire local and regional policies. Uh, I'm, I'm humbled by all the references uh, so far today. There's no need to add anything, but the focus on crises obviously is, is, is crucial. Cities usually carry the biggest loads in managing crises. Most of the Ukrainian refugees will find their homes and schools in cities. Also, COVID was experienced most dramatically in our cities. We don't need to remind ourselves of this. Uh, another aspect of thinking of the stakeholders is, is advice and training should be given, I think, for communicating international research in the local context. The, the previous speaker referred to this. The, the language of international research is, is challenging and we need to have uh, specific skills in, in adapting this to the local needs. Uh, spatial relevance is, is important and I think the question of uh, level of data is, is, is a question that I've raised a number of times before and I think for cities this is very important. Uh, social economic discrepancies are often much bigger within cities than they are between regions. So we need data for small areas. Now this is complex because Eurostat doesn't collect this data automatically, although a lot of cities and countries already do. So I think ESPON uh, should have a responsibility to make use of that locally collected data in a kind of data mining and, and uh, local resourcing. Uh, land use dynamics for the Green Deal. Uh, so far, as far as we've seen, the, the 5055 program introduces this land ceiling uh, concept for, for the value of green space for carbon capture. This is obviously uh, fundamental. But within the developed areas that are already built, it's just as important now to think about how the built environment is used and organized in the future. As a number of the speakers have already mentioned, traffic reduction in the long term is essential. Otherwise, we're, we're going to carry on being dependent on oil and resources that are spread around the globe. Uh, so this requires strong development priorities around local urban nodes. All city planners know this. And the evidence should be presented at the European level. This is a, an area which I think the cities are very concerned that ESPON should focus on. ESPON project management model is, is highly recommended. We've had very good experience working with, together with ESPON on the target analysis uh, methodology, early involvement, supporting the network's communication, and high level of quality control from secretariat. This has all been very beneficial, so I'd uh, warmly welcome uh, that, that approach to be continued. Uh, lastly, on that list, outreach and communication. Having completed uh, a couple of projects, uh, target analysis with, with ESPON, we were we were very honored to be able to take part in some of the outreach work. And this, I think, gave a huge added value both to ourselves as stakeholders, but also to uh, recipients of outreach programs, whether it's in Prague or Riga or Nova Gorica I was involved in. And of course, this is happening across, across Europe. So I would warmly encourage that, both for the stakeholders themselves and, uh, and, and for the recipient cities. Finally, I have a short list of key themes which we would like to see followed up in, in this. Temporary land use is, a, is a, uh, an increasing challenge, uh, and particularly in the context of deprived areas, uh, finding new ways of uh, stimulating growth within cities. Healthy and vibrant public spaces and walkability has been referred to already. This is very important in the future. Digitalization and the spatial consequences of working patterns also within cities, we're seeing this already uh, as a result of COVID, uh, where more and more people are working at home who can, but of course there are large areas of uh, residential areas of cities where people are not able to work from home. 
uh, foundational economy is uh, is essential, and that the, the idea of metropolitan self sufficiency could be an in interesting question. Uh, last, but by no means least, is the question of housing. Uh, we're, we're all aware that housing is not uh, primarily a uh, policy responsibility of the European Union, but housing gets it, it's, it's a huge spatial question, it's a huge social question. It really is right down the dividing line between the environmental and the and the socioeconomic uh, issues that we're, we're facing. Affordable housing is a challenge across nearly all European cities, especially those that are experiencing uh, continued growth. So that could, that is uh, an area which I think it would be very valuable for Espon to work on. Thank you very much. Maybe that was it was this six minutes. Thank you. I, I forgot to start my my timer there on, on that one, but um, it, it, don't, but trust me, I have it have it going here over and over in the corner, uh, keeping an eye a sharp eye. No, you're all doing wonderful. Thank thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, we're hearing you know a couple of themes coming through here already. Uh, the, also in the context of COVID, the idea of remote working and how that works in different environments, uh, rural and urban, uh, all quite interesting indeed. And some quite a bit of food for thought uh, ideas about uh, w how things could be done better and what's, what's working well already. So appreciate all of that. Uh, we have two more speakers left. Uh, one is Luke Berlins, uh, we're going to hear from now, the leader of the trans transnational outreach of the Espon Contact Point Network. Luke, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks, uh, Terry. Hope you can hear me. Yes, very well. Okay. Uh, I've prepared some slides, but I don't know if they come up, but um, uh, just to assure the previous speaker, we, we are doing the Transnational Out Outreach Project. Uh, we have hosted so far in the last two years, 25, more than 25 events, and we will still do four in the next uh, two months, amongst one in Norway um, and one uh, in, uh, in the house of the next speaker uh, with uh, Marie Lorraine in France. Um, uh, here you have the slide, yeah, next please. Um, and also in re reference to the Minister Claude uh, Turmes, um, you can see, um, no, you can don't see here, but uh, we also outreach not only to European uh, member states, but also you've got here the first line where we even reach out not only to the UK and American uh, audience, but also and most predominantly also to the Asian and African countries. So apparently uh, some uh, 15 to 20 percent of our entities come from there. Uh, so apparently Espon evidences is not only interesting for uh, European countries, but also for uh, other continents. And we also have reached out the last two years uh, for two third uh, to people uh, and uh, audiences which weren't f f familiar with Espon uh, previously. So the outreach is not only going to um, the, um, the, um, the, the usual subjects, but also to the other ones. Yes, next please. Um, and we also uh, try to monitoring very well what we are going to do with the events. And we have got every time after the events, we've got uh, policy addresses with our ECPs, the European contact points, and also with the MC members, the monitoring committee members. And here you see that uh, the ESPON evidence uh, are really followed up. But uh, the last point is that there is still a big gap between the European and ESPON studies and uh, the domestic um, interests and what they what they can do. Um, so therefore, my next slide, yes, please. Um, if, if, if you want to go for a new targeted uh, analysis, which is very important, I would say, with regard to the stakeholders, we have heard previously, but also with regard to the citizens, um, uh, perhaps we can focus in a new program more not only on agenda setting uh, so lots of researches evidences are going uh, about that uh, in espon but also with regard to implementation um and perhaps that has something to do with what timo said about accompanying activities next to the push and pull activities 
And to give some example, we, we, we recently have um, uh, uh, finished uh, the Espon uh, Stice report, Sustainable Transport and Travel in the Euro Delta. Um, and there we concluded that there are still uh, 20 to 25 um, percent is being flown uh, within to and uh, and, uh, and towards uh, and from uh, the Euro Delta uh, uh, below than 500 kilometers. And those uh, distances can easily be uh, addressed also by uh, high speed train travel. Um, so, but in order to um, to implement uh, those ideas to to drive from plane to train, you could say um, that there needs some coordinated actions. So it is not only needed uh, to, to adapt the open skies uh, skies agreement over here that is purely on the European level, but there is also a coordinating action action on domestic level. So how to improve high speed train travel, and then you can come up to a tripling or even quadrupling on some corridors uh, on high, high speed train travel. Um, an, another example I've uh, I've heard also from uh, Marc Lemaitre uh, this morning um, that resilience is very pre predominant over here, but uh, also in my university, Ghent University, but also in other universities, we have already done lots of work with regard to resilience. And here, more uh, based on case evidences, we come more and more on three types of resilience. One is the kind of engineering resili resilience, where when where after a hazard, you want to go back as soon as, as possible to the original situation. But you have got also socio-ecological resilience, where you want to flip into a new uh, situation, which is more resilience than uh, the previous one, or to uh, co-evolutionary uh, uh, co resilience, which means integrated actions, not uh, on the various levels, not only on the European, and not only on the national, but also on the domestic and regional levels. Um, so those are some examples uh, where you might have on the specific uh, thematic action plans more focus, uh, more focus on, and then I will leave it with this. Perfect, Luke. Very good timing. I really appreciate that, and uh, also some some excellent thoughts there and and observations regarding outreach and uh, and where Espon moving forward could perhaps. Uh, you know, it has some room for improvement, things that can be worked on and made even better. Uh, excellent. Very good. We're doing well. Uh, and we have uh, one more speaker uh, before we move on to the question and answer session. Uh, Marie-Lorraine Donjard, uh, already mentioned, uh, chair of the ESPON Monitoring Committee. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you for having me. Um, I'm not going to come back on all the things that have been said by previous speakers, especially on policy priorities. I was just m thinking to myself that all the themes that have been mentioned reminded me of all the discussions in the monitoring committee where everybody was carrying a priority theme and we couldn't put them together because, you know, you. you F1 is a comparatively small program, special, even though now it has it's going to have a lighter, bigger budget. So everything cannot be dealt with at the same time. Um, I'm just going to briefly come back to the first question. I think, Terry, I think your name is, uh, asked at the beginning of the session, which is that how did this thing evolve? I sort of followed, I'm a dinosaur, so I sort of followed Espon since its beginning from different um, different places, and indeed uh, at the beginning, uh, Espon studies were quite pioneering, uh, and uh, but they didn't have so much competition, so it was quite easy to be pioneering, pire, a pioneer at that time, and. Um, you know, place-based now is sort of mainstream, uh, and you have nearly all uh, OECD, the Commission. They do. Sometimes it's difficult to compete with um, the response. Like forces are difficult. Uh, 
can, it's a bit David against Goliath. You, you can't really compete. So what, what I find interesting in what happened to Espan is that they've, maybe it's due to share management, maybe it's due to the innovativeness of the, of the program itself, is that they've always put into question, uh, well, at least since I'm, I've been there, um, the committees have always put into question the, the results and how they could improve uh, their results to touch more, uh, to reach out uh, a larger number of people. It's a progressive thing, but it's true that if you, if I, especially in France, where actually Espoir does not have that much audience, if you think of it, uh, at at first, you know, basically Espoir was a bunch of studies uh, that were on your shelf or not, but a bunch of studies, and you had to read the 600 pages. Um, I think the whole process during the past program was really to, to see how how you could change that, how you could uh, touch a larger audience with um, targeted analysis, workshops, MOOCs, uh, accompanying um, the presidencies, accompanying pilot actions, and um, some were successful, some less, but still they tried, they were always on their feet. And I think that is that process allowed them to be more innovative in the way they delivered. And uh, this, uh, the, the one thing that I think we're still banging our heads again is to, against is to really reach out at the international level. Um, this is a place where governance is very necessary. This is a place where a lot of the uh, ESPON work could be useful, um, especially I, I realize that case uh, examples, case studies are very useful. And um, one example that I'm quoting, I think it's Estonia. What they did was to work on the ESPON productions and say how, taking examples from the ESPON work, how is this relevant to us? Because sometimes if you have a targeted anal analysis in Norway, you don't see how it's relevant necessarily to you. You don't get the reader to read. And they've done that with quite a lot of success. And I think all these experiences of delivering are really worth working on because the material is interesting, but the, sometimes it's difficult to get the reader to read it. And all the consultation process that ESPON is doing now has led us to the 2030 program with these overarching TAP uh, subjects, which in my view cover quite a holistic, um, in a holistic way, a lot of the priorities that have been touched upon this morning. Um, uh, and um, if I could have a wish, is one thing that can be tricky later on is, is what Victor said about moving on from research to more policy uh, delivery and policy explanations. There's a, a sort of fragile tipping point between keeping the research angle, uh, being credible as a research institution or, pro or program, and trying to package, I'd say, the policy making without moving off to losing a ba the base of research and turning into a communication agency, which it should not be. So that will be uh, something we'll have to be very careful about, I think. Um, and also, as I think, uh, I don't remember, I think it's Peter, one side or, or, or Nick, I don't know, uh, one side does not fit all. It is very apparent in our discussions in the monitoring committee and in the way I see how people react to the, um, to the research that, and to the policy papers, that it is not relevant that some of the, do of the recommendations of of ESPON are not always relevant to all publics. Uh, often the questions are, and it is it, it is a difficult thing sometimes. Sometimes the questions are work better 
at least for example sometimes in in my in my country sometimes the que questions work better than the and the case studies works better than the recommendations it's a very touch and go exercise and i think we don't we shouldn't underestimate the work of the of the mc of the uh, ma and the egtc on that because they're really trying to reach as much as possible and i'm pretty confident that they that what they they will go on, on on that on that basis. Did I keep to the time? I, I hope so. I would say yes. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate that. You've you've all been been wonderful in, in keeping us on time. So that means that we do have time for some discussion uh, before we get to the closing remarks. The the idea is to wrap all of this up. Uh, I think it's at one o'clock. So we we have we do have some time here. Um, the, we're going to try to get going with the, with the closing remarks in, uh, well, I guess, 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, so let's, um, let's jump straight to the questions. Again, thanks to all of you. Already some great input. Um, a lot of, you know, I can see in the room here with the people absorbing the, the ideas that have been coming through. Uh, very, very valuable indeed. Uh, we have some questions that are coming through on Slido. Uh, so a couple of them, or at least one of them, addressed directly to one of the speakers we just heard from. So I'm going to pick that one up first uh, before I get uh, put a question to all of you, which has been uh, just rising up the, the ranks of the questions here uh, all day long. So uh, first, a, a question from Anonymous to uh, Nicholas Brooks, uh, he asking, could you please further specify which types of res which types of results on geographic specificities would be needed to support uh, your group's work? So, Nicholas, if you'd like to uh, respond. Thanks very much, uh, Terry. Yeah, uh, what I meant. So, if you, it's a shame I don't have a slide with the membership of um, our organisation behind me or in front of you, because we represent. Uh, 150 uh, different member regions, but crucially, we represent uh, regions that are uh, that have, uh, if you like, uh, recognition in the EU treaty under Article 174 or Article 1349, or in terms of the uh, the accession treaty of Finland and uh, Sweden, for example. I'm talking here about um, uh, islands, outermost regions, and northern sparsely populated areas, um, and. Um, where we valued a lot uh, Espon's uh, work in the past, and that's something I referred to in my statement, is when you help provide territorial evidence to support our general claim, which is that EU policies, and not just cohesion policy, I'm talking about state aid, transports, uh, the CAP, and so on and so forth, should acknowledge uh, those specificities at, uh, when, when, when they're being designed. Uh, so that's, that's what I was referring to uh, mm. in general terms. Okay. I hope I've answered the question. <laughs> yeah, no, they're very, very helpful. Very good. Let me just check, see if anything has popped up in, in the meantime. Good. Um, there's the, what we've heard so far. We've heard you know, lots of uh, valuable ideas about you know, what's working, what could be done better. And that's, of course, the, the nature of this process, you know, to, to help all stakeholders see where ESPON is and where it's trying to go and how to get there with the input from people like yourselves. So uh, one, of, one of the general questions that's come through here uh, today too is regarding uh, local authorities, regarding how to, in, how to reach out, this whole outreach question that keeps coming up, how to reach out and involve local authorities so that the results of the studies, you know, how they're designed and the results, uh, take them into consideration as far as possible. Of course, there are countless local authorities. You can't take them all into consideration. But how do you, in general, approach that process? Any suggestions uh, from, specific suggestions from the panel on how that could be done? Uh, bringing you in, we can do that if you just raise your hand physically, because I can see you all. OK, great. Uh, then then let's, uh, let's start then by, we'll, get, we'll bring in P Peter uh, from, from Oslo. Peter, I, I think the best the best way is to uh, it, it, it's the way as the ESPON Secretariat has worked, I think, quite successfully during the target, some of the targeted analysis by uh, close involvement discussion uh, with the stakeholders themselves at an early stage in the work. Uh, it's not a requirement, but it's uh, it's it's a, it's a fairly obvious uh, way forward that. 
the projects themselves should have some kind of political basis, policy basis to start with. This is a question that politicians are uh, really keen to get some answers on. Uh, and then once that is done, as, uh, as, as a, the, the last of the speakers uh, referred to, I think the idea of having workshops, um, uh, sort of future studies, maybe some, uh, some small scenario processes, this kind of thing can always help as well, because that, that's a way of involving more local stakeholders in the discussion. Uh, it, it, it's a kind of a mix between the, this is always the balance question. Now, how, how far do you, how far is this a workshop process and how far is this is general research? And I think some of the, some of the approaches have been quite good in getting this balance right, but it's obviously a challenge because you have to get the research needs and you have to have the quality control at, at that level. Uh, so I, I, I think the ESPON team has actually done quite well in that uh, so, so far, but uh, there's, there's more we can do. I would also strongly recommend uh, some communication training for stakeholders. So they are actually ha have some special skills uh, of how to interpret English uh, densely written research reports into both the local language in, in linguistic terms, but also in terms of local understanding. So it becomes relevant. Uh, it's, it's the stakeholders themselves who are actually able to do this. You can't invite other uh, local researchers to do that because they will also write in research language. This, this, is, this is the task for, for uh, the bureaucrats such as myself to do. It, it, it's difficult, but it it's really is the central task. I think if ESPON could try and uh, kick off with some training, slightly formalised in some way in that, it would be a great help. Excellent. Thank you, Peter. Um, let's bring in Victor here. Well, that's, uh, that's my immediate reaction. Peter, thank you very much for uh, great advice and hints on how to make uh, ESPON simpler in communicating the territory evidence. This has been the process we've been running now for a couple of weeks also in our team, how to simplify, get closer, get simpler, quicker, and so on and so forth. And uh, some of your advice will be definitely taken on board, already has been taken on board in terms of creating cross-cutting expertise, in terms of involving stakeholders at a very early stage of scoping down the specification of ESPON service. So we want, no matter what kind of service, what kind of activity we talk about, we want to see who is then the specific stakeholder, what are the specific needs, why ESPON is the right tool, and when the service is needed. So going from the very end, we are able then to program the service exactly to the needs and also hold the stakeholder accountable for ensuring the commitment to the process also in the policy uptake. So one idea is that, say we have a workshop, p-learning workshop, whatever, or we present case studies, results. Half a year later, we would like to know from that stakeholder what happened. Did you use it? Was it illuminating for you? in your policy process. So please be so kind, go back to us and report what good or bad happened to the, uh, the service. It was really appreciated or not. So we can have this entire policy cycle also at the very center of attention. And also we would like to have a small revolution in the deliveries by ESPON. So no longer very long think reports that the researchers will be requested to produce. They may produce if they wish but we'll hold them for shorter report and the summary or the policy brief, depending on the situation, to be written with simpler language, easier to digest. Also with someone with communications expertise or media relations expertise on the team that we would like to contract. So the researchers, yes, but cross-sectoral with cross-cutting experience and also someone on the team with this media communications experience. I fully agree the reports are hardly digestible very often, and they don't bring a lot of added value by being 600 pages long. So we need to simplify that. Thank you. Any other uh, comments? Oh, I see. Uh, look, there are hands all around. Uh, uh, so I, I, I didn't keep track, unfortunately, of who raised their hand first. Um, so I will say, well, let's go back to the, to the very beginning and bring in Duarte Rodriguez first. Many thanks. I think there are two major challenges. So the engagement of local actors that you you raised the question and let me give the contribution. I, I see the peer learning process as a very promising approach on that. Uh, 
the previous speaker already talked about several ways to improve that. Um, but I would like to underline the promising concept that you uh, write in, in, the, in the documents on the policy prototyping. Uh, I feel this concept very promising because we definitely need more policy experimentation and I think ESPON could be a very good and robust source of it. It's a combination between the research, the knowledge and the people on the ground, so the local actors. Um, but being well monitoring, I think this policy prototyping could be very, very useful for both, either for understanding better the research and also for understanding the, the needs from the policymakers. Second topic I would like to touch upon is this communication broker. It's a challenge everywhere. It's not an SPON issue, so it's a challenge everywhere. Um, I think the policy briefs is a well-proofed way of making the bridge. Uh, OECD did it. We did it in our evaluation. We had the same problem, so how to translate the huge and very robust reports from the evaluation exercise on the policymakers, and then a one-page policy brief uh, with well-targeted recommendations is a, a very good idea. But again, it's, it's a major challenge how to communicate better, taking into account the risks that uh, our previous colleague says on not being a communication agency. So how to be in the right, in the right track, it's, it's really challenging. Um, and I think we need to use better the, the SPAN results on the evaluation of cohesion policy. We need to make these two worlds close to each other. To give you an example, I, reading the cohesion report, I found that the ESPAN results are underexploited on cohesion reports. So we need to uh, take in closer uh, ESPAN approach, ESPAN evidence, ESPAN uh, uh, work, and evaluation of cohesion policy, either at the European level, or national level, or regional level. So that's my contributions for this debate. Back to you. Excellent. Uh, thank you. Very good. Uh, let's bring in, I guess, Nicholas here. Um, uh, again, and then we'll, we'll, no, we'll bring in Luke. Luke, go ahead. We've already had uh, an answer from Nicholas. We'll come right back to you, Nicholas, and uh, and then we'll, we'll get around to uh, Marie Laurent. Okay. Thank you, Terry. Um, with, with regard to involving local stakeholders, um, I think Espen has done already a, a wonderful job with the targeted analysis. But mo mainly, the, when I look at the targeted analysis, it remains report, and after that, nothing happens. So, um, what we are trying to do now, which I, with the thesis report I already mentioned, is not only to outreach um, to uh, the, the, the evidence of the thesis report to the broader public, but also make the next step, how to, uh, how to implement uh, those uh, conclusions. And there is, uh, for, for our outreach um, workshop, we have planned to do that uh, the 27th of April. It's a still a kind of experiment, I must say. But we managed for the first time to have as well high-level uh, policy makers on board, not only for D DG MOVE, uh, so for the D Director General uh, General um, MOVE, but also from the Flemish and the Brussels regions, as well as a closing word, word for politicians, and as well as um, businesses, uh, for instance, infra providers and the airport authorities, who have to deliver over here. Uh, so, um, that's our, our, our first try out to say, okay, perhaps we can do something over here to go beyond uh, just the report and the ESPON evidences, but to, to, to really involve all the stakeholders involved. Okay. Next to that, um, in the academic sphere, we are also at the moment busy, but not on European level, but on local and regional level with living labs and with uh, social citizen science. Uh, which might be, I think, also um, interesting to do, to, to experiment with these concepts uh, on a European level. And that might also um, be included in the next program of uh, ESPROM. Thank you, Luke. Uh, Nicholas, briefly, if you can. 
Well, I'll be brief because actually uh, what I wanted to say have already been, has already been mentioned by Peter and Luke. Um, really, I think to engage with regions, uh, local authorities better, involve them at an earlier stage indeed. And I know that uh, that's already what Esmond is doing. But um, to give you an example, you know, we as a, an organization that represents uh, regions, both on a political and technical level, we have a number of working groups on transport, cohesion policy and, and so on and so forth. And, um, and we use these working groups to actually, uh, you know, uh, inform our members of what's coming up in terms of the EU policy agenda and to discuss then on how we might be able to influence uh, specific EU policies. And where we might be able to work a little bit better with Espon is to uh, involve uh, you at this stage where, you know, we're trying to find the evidence that, you know, the future of EU transport policy should be better targeted to specific territories. I don't know, things like that. And I think here you can help. And also, to completely agree with the last comment from Luke, and I think I was looking at the policy brief, the excellent policy brief uh, published in 2017 on the territories with uh, specific geographical handicaps. And it's, it's, it's 12 pages long. It's extremely interesting and, and useful and relevant. But the way forward uh, part of the report is only two paragraphs long. So I think where you... The, the advice and it, it, you know, it links it with what I was saying earlier, I think you might want to go a, an extra step and actually say, well, the, the policy recommend, you know, policy recommendations wise, this is what we would advise and go that extra step. I think that will be very valuable. Thank you. And finally, um, Marie-Laurent uh, Danger. Uh, yeah, a lot of people have said the same thing, so I'll try to avoid repeating. Um, I want to come back to the fact that stakeholders uh, are not all the same. And uh, this is where the work of, of a small program like ESPON is tricky, because they, they should, in theory, in the abstract, tailor to the different stakeholders. And that's what's complex. For the local and regional authorities, um, like for us, our challenge is first to get them interested at all in the, um, in the European dimension, in thinking of looking abroad, in thinking of, and they are confronted with, of course, a language barrier, which is that most of the productions of ESPON are in English, and a lot of our local authorities don't really, really, I mean, it's not that none of them speak English, but like they would be a bit taken, you know, they are a bit at all with English, let's put it that way. So one thing that is really useful is these cross uh, looks where you work on, you're working on things, not necessarily the targeted analysis, but you take a general theme that you have been at national level and regional level working on and you add the experiences that have been coming from other countries. And that's where the TNO work is interesting because you can really tailor it to your audiences. Um, one thing I'm a bit more uh, worried about because Nick, Nick has been talking about policy briefs and policy recommendations. This is for, I'd say, a micro level sometimes. What is sometimes a bit difficult to sell for us in these policy papers is that they're neutralized. Because they are very um, general, uh, they are sometimes difficult for local authorities. It's difficult to, to take a grip on them because they're, they're, it's a general speak. It talks a lot to the European Parliament. It means a lot to policymakers at mm, mm, general level, but sometimes at the operational level, it's a bit difficult to identify. Whereas in some of the studies that they, that from which this policy briefs come, in fact, case studies have been very concrete and could be very usable. So it's, it's very difficult to generalize what, a, how rich, how you, how you sort of shorten a study. This is an answer to, to Victor. It's not an easy task. They are really confronted with difficult uh, targets and difficult expectations. So good luck for them, to them.
<laughs> <laughs> Luck and hard work. Uh, that's that's what we. It's how we how we move forward together and cooperation. Uh, thank you, thank you all. Thank you, thank you to all all the panelists. It's a very very interesting input. Uh, also, you know, one of the things that came through in this discussion for me, uh, also because I, I work with policy briefs, is that. Uh, within ESPON, this move towards policy briefs, this is, seems to be, the, the, the uptake of that seems to be quite positive, uh, that translating those into uh, literally the language that people can, can understand and also expressing them in ways uh, uh, that would uh, address specific stakeholders at, at local level, that um, you know, that is, remains a challenge. Uh, of course, but it, anyway, it sounds uh, sounds very very encouraging indeed. Very very helpful suggestions. Very uh, very useful indeed. Thank you very much to all of our speakers. Um, I can tell that, that many of your ideas uh, have are are being are going through the minds of the people who are working on on this program and rolling it out right now. So we're moving to the very last stage of our of our program today of our conference. Uh, the closing remarks. We have a good 25 minutes wrapped up, uh, left for all of that. Um, the, we have three speakers that we'll bring in. The, our first speaker is someone you haven't heard from yet today. Uh, Milanda Hron Hronkova, uh, one of the, representing the members of the ESPON Monitoring Committee as well, uh, is going to try to make sense of what we've been talking about today and, and sum it up in, in a way that will help us uh, appreciate, identify some of the key messages and perhaps give us some input based on her perspective as, as well. The floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and thank you for the invitation. And uh, first, I would like to thank all the speakers for their rich inputs to the discussion that gave us many new ideas and inspired us. And uh, also, my special thanks belongs to the monitoring committee members and program members for their valuable inputs during the TAP consultation process and also during the preparation of the new ESPON program. And, it was mentioned by the moderator already that we have enough food for the thoughts. And however, in light of a new emerging challenging, our discussion has definitely to continue. And uh, as a monitoring committee member of the ESPON program representing the Czech Republic, uh, I'd like to appreciate the ESPON, uh, ESPON program results and its long-term operation that has been dedicated to most of the regions in Europe. And in terms of my work, at the Ministry of Regional Development uh, and being in the daily contact uh, with the policy makers. I perceive the ESPON result as a very beneficial and important for their responsible decision making. And uh, it was said by many people today that the evidence-based policies are currently needed more than ever. And uh, I also welcome the shift of the program towards the more proactive involvement of stakeholders. It was explained by Timo by his presentation and uh, focus on the activities related to knowledge development, uh, which aims to provide useful evidence to the policymakers. And I think it's important to find a way how to make uh, scientific evidence accessible and ready to use for the policymakers. It was also mentioned many times. So we can connect and inspire them at the right time, as Victor said. And regarding the evidence production, uh, we also have a very good experience with the targeted analysis, case-based studies and spin-off studies. But uh, we also urgently need to continue in the European wide thematic activities, such as applied research projects. And we constantly need to update ESPON database. And we have a saying in the Czech Republic that there is nothing older than the yesterday newspapers. And I think the same can be also applied for the evidence production. Our role is also to further encourage and uh, discuss how to encourage more scientists from the older regions of Europe and increase the competition among them in order to maybe further improve the quality of research. And uh, with its location in the Central Europe, uh, Czech Republic is encouraged to actively participate in many international activities. And I would like to mention here one current example that is transnational project core cup, uh, based on which uh, Czech Republic should have a better connection with the neighboring countries through the high speed railways in the future. And uh, this is also the way how to reduce the traffic and improve the mobility as it was mentioned by Minister Claude Turme. 
and uh, this means of the transport is fully competitive with the air transport and it is it can be another contribution to the green transition so it's clear that the implementation of similar project is very important for further development of the European territories in line with uh, the fulfillment of the cohesion policy objectives. And in order to have more similar projects, uh, we, need, uh, we need sufficient and exact evidence about the territory. And this is something what I think ESPON has always offered and will continue to do so in a new ESPON program. And, uh, it's great to hear that uh, the combination of the green transition and just transition is the right way. And uh, definitely to promote cohesion policy as value by evidence and make it more effective and understood it's, it's a crucial role of the ESPON. And uh, re regarding the thematic action plans, uh, I would be delighted if Czech Republic becomes part of as many as projects as possible. And, uh, I think that the proposed thematic actions plans are more than relevant and I welcome them all as they respond to the current challenges and opportunities. And when we were suggesting these TAPs, we could hardly imagine that uh, we would experience many other crises for the moment. And uh, for example, the crisis in Ukraine showed us how viable energy self-sufficiency is. And it was also mentioned by Mark Lemaitre, I think that uh, uh, the crisis uh, has become, this crisis has become an engine for spinning and the transformation to green economy, same like uh, COVID pandemic has been facilitating the digitalization process. And that's why I think that the TAP on the climate and neutral territories is more than relevant. Maybe we, I can also highlight the concept of energy communities. It wasn't mentioned here. It's, for some member states, it's a still a new phenomenon, and uh, uh, this is a new opportunity uh, to be uh, to, to, in, in the energy of self-sufficiency for us. And regarding uh, the TAP governance and new geographies, it was said uh, by, I think, by Mark Lemaitre that we have to find a way how to think beyond the administrative borders and uh, boundaries. And, uh, think uh, the functional areas and uh, I, we have uh, one example in Czech Republic because we have a three level hierarchy and uh, when we look the, to the previous spawn research uh, uh, the project metro showed us that uh, Czech metropolitan areas are not given priority by government and uh, however we see that their added value is significant as they face several challenges uh, at the metropolitan level such as housing transport or and any other and uh, we, we we see that they should be involved more in the future going beyond the eu cohesion policy programming and uh, i think the follow ups of the metro project results could be more elaborated and welcome concerning the tap uh, places resilient to crisis we heard a lot and uh, we are facing many crises at the moment. And uh, for example, it was said that by analyzing the impact of COVID on urban development and management of cities, uh, it can contribute to increasing the city's resilience in the future. And uh, definitely the crisis in Ukraine brings additional risks and open rooms for further analysis and monitoring of the resilience of the different member states their governance and capacity building, um, maintenance of equal access to education, uh, healthcare, access to public services, strengthening the cyber resilience also. And it was mentioned safeguarding the democratic principles of European countries, for example, by the deepening the participatory approach in local policy making. Uh, and not to be just fight fires, as this was said by the commission at Elisa Foreira, uh, it requires uh, the, the consequences of Ukraine crisis requires further discussion at the program level and a lot of work on a new concept of resilience in Europe. And finally, I would like to mention the last TAP perspective to all people where the socioeconomic factors are the main subjects of an analysis. And I would like to mention here that the Czech presidency also aims to bring knowledge regarding uh, the disparities of European regions in relation to their innovation capacity. 
we are currently working together with the EGTC on a study that will assess and explain the regional innovation capacity. And in terms of um, in terms uh, of the development of, in terms of the development of innovation and assess the role of regional public authorities in using the potential of uh, innovation diffusion across the European regions. We want to test uh, we want to test the effect of entrepreneurial regional governance on innovation capacity. So finally, I would like to remember another saying: Fortune favors the prepared. And looking to all the TIP, I appreciate its flexible focus that addresses many different issues. And it's important today to respond quickly to the emerging challenges in the world that is changing before our eyes every day. And we must ensure that thanks to ESPON evidence, we can better understand the capacities and opportunities of our countries, include maybe more global dimension to ESPON program and definitely respond to becoming challenging as fast as possible. I think it's all. Thank you very much for the attention. It was a pleasure to be there. Thank you very much, Milada. You did a wonderful job of summing up uh, some of the points that we've had today and also on picking up on some of the different uh, work streams, the different thematic action plans and relating them to, to what's going on uh, in, in your country as it prepares to take over the, uh, the EU uh, presidency. Thank you so much. Um, so we, uh, you mentioned also, Milada, the, the the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the conflict, the war in Ukraine, it's what it is, uh, and what, Im what the implications that that will have. This has been raised a couple of times today already, and it is the question that is uh, showing up, that it keeps moving to the very top of our list uh, of questions that we've received today. And I am in our, from Slido, from our people, uh, audience joining us online, participants joining us online. Uh, 20, 21 people have given this question the thumbs up, so I feel a bit obliged to, uh, to also maybe put it here to, to the two representatives of ESPON that we have with us uh, here in Luxembourg. And the question is this, um, this is, I'm not expecting you to address this uh, exclusively, but perhaps to take it into consideration when formu formulating your, your final remarks. The question is, how does ESPON intend to address the territorial consequences of the ongoing war in its research projects? And again, you know, this war began on February 24th, or the invasion began on February 24th. <laughs> it hasn't been that long. It's been another shock, another, another crisis uh, on top of the COVID crisis, on top of the financial crisis, uh, and we're dealing with the energy uh, emergency as well. But uh, the climate emergency. So I'll put that uh, to the two of you. Uh, and Victor, you can begin. You Victor Shadorovsky, director of the ESPON EGTC. Correctly so. Um, of course, we are not a new investment program. So we cannot provide uh, funding for infrastructure to, within any recovery, resilience plans and facilities. Still, I think what is of uh, utmost importance for decision makers to understand the implications, what it means to have the war, what it means in terms of trade relations with the affected areas, but also the areas that will be under embargo so that the trade flows will be crippled or altered. Also what it means in terms of the refugee flows, how we can accommodate them in our societies, what it means for the uh, concept of cohesion, economic, social, territorial. And this is where we are coming in. And for some of the ongoing projects, we are including the aspect of analyzing the territorial impacts of the uh, crisis induced by the war for the economic and social performance of the regions. So one specific project called ERIE will investigate this quite new element in the entire equation to give very quick information back to policymakers still during the French presidency term on what it means, how to prepare, how to accommodate this shock. Just an example. Sure. What we can rapidly, as I mentioned, Very rapidly well. react to the ongoing change in the situation. Of course, this is a uh you know, this is very early days, uh, yeah. and the consultation process uh, happened before the war. 
Uh, so there's, there's still quite a bit to, to react to. Uh, we have about seven minutes left. I'm going to try to wrap us up uh, on time. But uh, did you, Victor, you know, because you, this, you, know, you have a large stake in, in how this SBON moves forward, heading, looking at, uh, at SBON 2030, the, then the next seven-year planning program. Uh, what would you have to say to the you know, over 300 participants who joined us today uh, as ESPON moves forward into this uh, new era with its thematic action plans and, and uh, new orientation? Ten pages already uh, put here on paper. So some notes, very interesting notes, some uh, reflections and observations that com confirm our philosophy about how we would like to adapt to the change and also how we could become the catalyst of change. We don't aspire as ESPON to induce the change because the change is to be induced by the receivers of ESPON service. We want to see that what we are bringing to them in terms of evidence and knowledge is actionable, meaning they understand what they can do with it and they are committed enough to implement the advice, the recommendations, the results of the evidence production and knowledge transfer via p-learning workshops, for instance, in their respective policies. And this is important. That's why I said we are not doing an assessment program that for them. We are doing that with them because we need them. If they are not part of the assessment community in terms of policy stakeholders, decision makers, then actually, as Marie Lorraine was saying, we might end up with our reports being lodged on a shelf, and we don't want it. We want to make a change, and as a meandering river, we want to adapt to all the all time changing uh, needs and gaps in knowledge and understanding of what's going on around us. So this is our philosophy that we are adapting to the changes, but also we want the stakeholders to be part of our playground that we experiment, that we prototype, that we help them understand the impact of what they are doing in terms of sectoral policies, but also what new we could bring to them so that they have better informed, more actionable uh, policies. And we want to reach out to the local and regional level more than before. We can engage them in case studies in all those pan-European research projects. We have some ideas how we can do it. We want to get them engaged from the very beginning when planning the specific sort of support service. And also for these different transnational outreach, as Luke was presenting, we will be certain that they could replicate a good practice existing in Oslo to Estonia or vice versa. Because otherwise, as some people were saying, this might be found at the very, you know, look at it, that it's maybe not that relevant for our area because it was made and produced down in Oslo. It's not, not true. We can use it. We can adopt it and use it and replicate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victor. Uh, uh, for the, our very final uh, word on, on our proceedings today and, and how we might look ahead, I will turn the floor over uh, to Timo Eza, who is with the ESPON Managing Authority. Okay, thank you, Thierry. Um, yeah, I mean, it's always famous uh, last words. <laughs> um, no, but I mean, the whole morning um, was very interesting for me also in the respect um, because it was the first test where we actually presented the whole program, whether we found the right twist now for, for this next eight years, I would say. And um, if I uh, go back to what has been said, I, I have to say that we, I think we are on the right track, um, especially with the thematic approach linking it, policy development. I mean, we, we have to be vigilant uh, in the way that we have a fast changing environment, I mean, thematically and now the wartime uh, um, challenges us and we need to be thematically open in that regard and I think we are prepared for that with our approach. Secondly, we have uh, also a changing environment in institutions working on certain themes. I mean, 
and that we have to um, be open and uh, invite all other research programs, institutions like OECD to collaborate on the evidence side. I think this, this also becomes um, even more clear and to involve with the stakeholders. And when I develop that uh, strand, I mean, I heard a lot about knowledge broker, interactive feedback, co-creation. I mean, this is where we have to further intensify, and I think we have now the means at hand to be uh, even better in that regard. And that brings me back, I mean, the whole question about involving regional local actors. I mean, uh, we haven't talked about that, what the program actually can deliver on that. For example, we, uh, we have uh, planned um, to give budgets to the national contact points in the countries um, to actually um, enable them to get in closer dialogue with stakeholders on the ground and firstly to um, to create i mean to discuss the context of the country and the region for the results i mean because we are i mean we can do a lot of research but to have really the on the spot knowledge and to bring that together and i mean just to say to invite stakeholders to know who is doing what in in the region i mean there we need their uh, uh, support the contact points, they will have a, uh, quite a, an important role and they are equipped with the resources and also to translate not only the context but also in language wise. I think we, we are, will yeah. invest in that regard as well, which was not the case uh, in, 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 the, um, in this programming period, which is now ending, but um, we are aware of that and, um, and we really um, uh, to care and um, yes, we. I mean, we are open and uh, we will stay in contact. And I thank you very much uh, for this rich, uh, rich feedback. Uh, it's all noted, as <laughs> as, uh, as Victor said. And um, uh, I think we have now uh, in the afternoon the monitoring committee, and we will rediscuss and reevaluate what has been said. I would also like to take the opportunity to thank you very much, <laughs> Terry, <laughs> to master us, uh, to lead us, uh, being a, 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 a stone in the uh, wild sea here. <laughs> so uh, um, thanks a lot, and um, uh, also the bringing here this uh, discussion atmosphere was very very useful and fruitful. I, I, I thank you for that. Thank you very much. Uh, th thanks, thanks to both of you. Um, thanks to Espon for, for having me and for uh, having me back again. This is re reconnecting with the Espon community has been very valuable. I hope next time we will see each all see each other in in person for all of you who uh, who i've met before and uh, who might be out there and, and tuned in today anyway uh, it's been a great pleasure for me to be part of this i've learned a lot uh, i it's it's interesting for me also to watch espon evolve and move move into a new new era um i've i found i found it fascinating and encouraging the the discussion about where things are headed and i i, I sense a, quite an evolution uh not to i'm not going to elaborate here, don't worry, but from this, from what Espon was to where it is now and to where it is going, it seems to be evolving in, in a very, uh, in a very, very positive direction. And hearing all the input from all of our speakers today uh, has reinforced the idea that there is a need for what Espon is doing, the kind of evidence in order to have evidence-based policy making in order to strengthen cohesion and ultimately democracy. So, uh, and resilience, of course, of being one of the, the main words of all of this. So, and he, again, thank you, thank you to Espon. Thank you for everyone who has joined us today. Thank you for your patience as well. To our technical crew, I know you had some, uh, some those Luxembourg gremlins to deal with uh, <laughs> who, that are quite, quite tenacious. And uh, I hope to, um, hope we can all connect again sometime soon. Thank you very much.